All righty. Howdy, everyone. Welcome to Unsafe Space Book Club. Uh, I'm your host, Carter Learn, and I'm joined by Carrie Smith, who is not is muted right now, but you'll hear from her in a moment. Today's book is Cynical Theories by Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay. Um, I'm going to let Carrie take over for a bit while I muck with some stuff. I just There's so many people in book club today, it's even hard to find Carrie. Uh, so... Hold on for just a moment. Carrie, Hello. are you there? Hi, I'm here. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's do this. I'll do that. Okay, oh, you great. are you are okay. live. Go, Carrie. So, welcome to Unsafe Space. This is our largest book club yet. I think we were breaking our previous record of around 15 people. And uh, just make a little confession up front. I have a fear of public speaking. You may not believe that since we do a podcast, <laughs> but uh, when I do a podcast, I don't have to see lots of people looking at me. And now because we have so many people, I'm a little nervous. So if you're nervous speaking on camera, if it's your first time doing a, 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 a live book club on camera, don't worry, because I'm nervous too. Um, so today we're doing Cynical Theories by Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay. I will say upfront, I apologize. They were both supposed to join us for a Q&A and both just canceled within the past couple of hours um, because of life happening. And we don't have to get into any of that. We're just here to talk about their book. Um, we're big, I'm a big fan of the book and uh, have an open door for, for each of them to come back on the show and talk about it at some point. Um, but you're just gonna have to be okay with it being just me and Carter today and maybe occasionally my dog. Um, so, <laughs> This book, usually, if it's your first time here, usually we have a smaller group of people and it's easier for us to just hear from everyone about their thoughts on the book and you know allow room for everyone to bring up questions they have or agreements or disagreements. Um, because we have a, such a large group today, I will ask that you try and keep your comments concise and um, we wanna be able to hear from everyone. And since there's so many people, if we start to get really in the weeds on something after quite a bit, I might jump in and say, let's hear from someone new. Um, also, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. That way we don't get any of the background noise that might be happening at your house, like dogs and dishes. So cynical theories. Um, my first thoughts on the book, I really appreciated it because if you don't know, um, if you're new to our show and, and new to this, this channel, uh, social justice ideology was my belief system for about two decades. And part of what we do on unsafe space is try and help explain or, and even figure out for myself, like what it is versus what it claims to be. And I appreciated this book because it, I, I view it as, as a very thorough sort of Bible on explaining what this ideology is versus what it claims to be about. And it also, it helped me to uh, go back and try and to think about the way in which I try and explain it when I try and do my nutshell version of social justice and maybe make some modifications to it. Because most often when I try and explain it to people who I consider to be maybe normies, like people who aren't very politically engaged, people who are just going about their daily life and, and now have encountered some aspects of social justice. Usually I try and say it's uh, best looked at as maybe a mutated form of Marxism that is focused around uh, identity and power that, it, that says that the best way to look at the world is as a competition for power among identity groups instead of instead of the way you know actual classical marxism said the best way to look at the world is as a competition for wealth among class groups so that's usually i've tried to use marxism as an analogy but now this is making me rethink that because they use postmodernism as the through line to help explain it better um, so that was one big takeaway i had from it was was trying to think about it more um, as something that grew out of postmodernism primarily with elements of Marxism, I guess. Um, the other thing that I liked about it personally is that since leaving social justice, I struggle a lot with, with trying to explain to people that I'm still liberal. I still view myself as liberal and that I, I'm a liberal. That's why I now oppose social justice ideology because 
I view it as being an illiberal authoritarian belief system that has no room for dissent and no room for discussion. And so I really appreciated that this book in some ways is a great defense of liberalism and you know, the concluding chapter, especially which lays out, I mean, just in black and white that um, the, the differences between liberalism and social justice and the reasons why liberalism is a better um, uh, way of looking at the world or a better system because it has brought us actual results. And so I really appreciated the defense of liberalism in the book. Um, I have other thoughts, but as I said, we have lots of people. So that's my yeah, initial yeah. thoughts on it. So Carter, do you want to share yours? And then we can kind of jump around and say hi to everyone. Uh, sure. Um, that, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the through line. I've spent some time reading bits and pieces of some of the the texts like although mostly it's been the um critical theory stuff and less the postmodern stuff although some of the postmodern stuff but having someone connect all the dots for me uh i found super helpful um because it allowed me to kind of see not just that these things were related but really how they were related in the etymology of the ideas in some sense um I will say that, uh, you know, I, I think we, maybe other people have an opinion about this, but one thing I actually don't like, which they use this in the book a couple of times. So I'll, maybe I'll start with something I didn't like, cause I, I mostly loved the book. So I'll, I'll pick on something that I, I, di I, I didn't like, and it's a minor thing, but there's this idea that things work in theory and not in practice, which is towards the end of the book, they talk about like, oh, well, this looks good on paper, but it doesn't work in practice. And one of the big problems that I've always had with postmodernism before it even, you know, uh, metastasized into this applied postmodernism stuff is it is on its surface, absolutely ridiculous and disconnected from reality. And it's to say that a theory works on paper when it's obviously disconnected from reality by beginning with premises like there is no objective reality. Um, to me, lowers the standard for philosophical discourse and allows people to build entire fields around nonsense. And I guess, I guess Wait. you could say that's fine. It's just a tax on society, and they're wasting their time. But I think you know, this is this is this should not be surprising. A lot of people at the time said this about about postmodernism. They said, "Well, someday someone's going to apply this crap. Someday." This is going to metastasize into absolute craziness. It will go to its logical conclusion, and uh, well, what, what, and here it here we are, right? Well, let me jump in for a second, just a second, because maybe I di I didn't have that takeaway that they were even arguing that it works on paper. I thought they were just trying to distinguish between early postmodernism, which I don't think that was the main point applied, of the book. Uh, yeah, I don't think that was a main point of the book, but it, it was a minor like. It was a minor nit that I had at the end where they talked about like, well, it works on paper. They said the same thing really? about Marxism. Yeah. And I was like, Marxism doesn't even work on paper. And, and Wait like, a minute. it's a reading comprehension problem. If you think Marxism works on paper, you're failing to comprehend that thing, that theory necessitates being connected to reality. So um, lots of people predicted that Marxism wouldn't work. Lots of people read the paper correctly and said it sucks on paper and will suck when applied in reality. Um, so that's the only thing I don't like because it excuses academia from having to meet the standards of reality correspondence. And I think that's generally a dangerous thing. It's a minor, minor nit though. I absolutely loved the book and I thought it was super helpful and informative. So I'm not wanting, I just, I figured I'd start with something nitpicky just for the hell of it. I don't know. <laughs> start okay. off the discussion. Okay. Uh, I think people should be able to, uh, I think I've said, I've made it so that people can unmute themselves now. So I think we can let people jump in if anyone else has comments and wants to jump in. So if I can, can y'all hear me? Yes. Yeah. So just related what's to- your, What's your name? Sorry. Hi, I'm Sam, everyone. Hi, Sam. Nice to thanks meet you. For, thanks for having me. So one thing that I, uh, one thing that I was critical of in this book was the extent of evidence provided 
for their interpretation of the original postmodernists, which I understand their main focus in the book is not to give an exegesis of the French theorists Foucault and Derrida and, and those people, but uh, it's very scant in terms of their actually building, like providing quotes and providing citations with page numbers. They cite Foucault a couple of times. Most of the time they just cite the entire book. They don't give a page number. I think they only give a page number for a Foucault quote in the first chapter once. Derrida, I don't think they even give a quote except for the one uh, quote that is always attributed to him with translated, there is no outside the text. Um, but if, if you go and read, you know, people who have more experience with the postmodernists, they will say that the interpretations that you get in chapter one, postmodernism, are straw men that nobody actually believes and that nobody has ever tried to defend because how, how, how could you? Um, so could you, could you give an example of one of those? So like what, what's yeah, like the, the straw claim men? that there is no objective reality that there is, or that there is no objective truth. So let me just jump in on that because claim. Did you not think that they drew a distinction between, because I, I used to say, uh, I guess pretty lazily, I would say that postmodernists believe there's no objective truth. And actually this book helped me see, I thought they, I thought they made a great distinction between saying, they're not saying there's no objective truth. They're saying that we can't possibly arrive. There's no way of arriving at objective truth at figuring out what that truth is because all different so, kinds of knowledge, you know, are equal. Is that not your takeaway of that? Oh, that's, that's helpful. So there's two ways you could construe the claim that there's no, that, that we can't get at the objective truth. One way is I think clearly correct, which is just like, yeah, we're all trapped in subjective experience machines and we can't, there, there's no, you know, Archimedean view from nowhere that we can access. So if they, if they meant it that way, that would be unobjectionable. But then the, the, the one that they rely on is the claim that all, all claims of, to truth or all forms of knowing or ways of knowing, right, are equal. You know, no view is, is any better than any other view. That's another claim that I've never seen anyone make. And they, they well, don't. I think, it, but in defense, I think, is, as you pointed out at the beginning, the purpose of this book was not to explain Foucault and Derrida. And I, the way that what I got out of this was this impression that, um, which I think is accurate, although I'm not an expert on postmodernism, but based on what I've, you know, Stephen Hicks writes about this and, and other people have written about it, like they, postmodernism was kind of cynically playful in a sense that like they didn't, they weren't running around actually trying to destroy things. They were kind of having intellectual, this was an intellectual exercise for them, not necessarily a thing that they wanted to go apply to the world. And what I got out of this book was, yeah, they played that game, but people came along later and took elements of that game and said, no, no, we're going to apply it now. So I don't think he was saying that Foucault and Derrida are like, directly, I, I don't think he's saying social justice, capital social justice ideology is directly applying Foucault and Derrida. I think he's saying they, they had some origins there and they took it beyond where the original postmodernists would have taken it. That's definitely the claim like that. To be clear, that is their claim, right? There, but, um, and so it, so again, even if this is just a misrepresentation, it's not that big of a deal. The, the thing that is a big deal, though, is because they identify the two postmodern principles and the four postmodern themes as the core of uh, theory, right, that becomes eventually there's applied postmodernism and reified or uh, so just social justice scholarship. The, that core is supposed to remain constant, right? You're supposed to have all of these scholars throughout that they cite throughout chapters one through eight are all gonna endorse, or at least are committed to versions of the postmodern knowledge principle, the postmodern political principle, 
cultural relativism, uh, the blurring of boundaries, the loss of the individual and the universal, and uh, the focus on language. And yet, uh, the, the, so I mean, I guess my broader claim is that they don't establish, um, especially in, in chapter eight, the philosophers that they're citing, um, they don't establish that for most of them. But that's, that's, you I'm going to, I'm going to jump yeah. in just because we have a chat from Jordan, who I don't know if you're here and want to, I mean, I think you are here because you're in the, the, the private chat. Uh, you can speak if you want. Jordan says, while reading this, I thought of the original postmodernists as the She Loves You era of the Beatles and the applied postmodernism as Sgt. Pepper's band era Beatles. <laughs> Similar instruments and origins, but it brings a ton of other ideas. Anyway, I thought um, that was funny. Can I say something? Yes. Yeah, please. Hi, I'm Mo. Um, Hi, Mo. Uh, I've been watching you guys for about six months now. So, uh, you know, really uh, privilege and honor. I hate the word privilege, but it is to be part of this. Um, I just want to say that I would actually switch it around. I would say the original postmodernists who were um, more complex and more intelligent um, are more the later Beatles. And then the dumbed, watered down version of postmodernism we get now is, you know, the She Katie Loves Perry? You Beatles. Please say Katy Perry. Uh, you're, yeah, you're probably right. Because She Loves You Beatles, like the early Beatles even, they have <laughs> levels of, you know, they, they harmonize like the Everly Brothers, as somebody said. So uh, they were so good. But uh, yeah, uh, that's how I would put it. Um, you know, each generation. I, I, I know somebody said that. It might have been James Lindsay. Somebody said that. Uh, well uh, Jordan says, hey, now let's not denigrate early Beatles. This may be the most contentious part of the book club today. I love the Beatles. Uh, okay. love yeah. So uh, that's what I want to say. Uh, the other thing I want to say was regarding Sam's thing. I mean, I have my own thoughts. I'm not just reactionary. But uh, the other thing I want to say regarding Sam's thing was, uh, uh, would he say that, that to, to, put, to put it, um, you know, in a, favorable light towards the authors that would you say Sam that um, uh, maybe uh, uh, Lindsay and Pluck Rose are correct um, in their in saying that that they just that the later you know activists just cherry-picked postmodernism they don't call themselves postmodernists but they just cherry pick what they like out of postmodernism and these are the things that they cherry picked out, you know, the four themes and the two principles, uh, um, you know, but it's not, they didn't actually, they're not actually descendants of postmodernism, which um, Plug, Rose and Lindsay agree if you watch your interview with Thaddeus Russell, which I did, it was a great interview. So, it was a great uh, interview, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that, uh, they say that there, right? They say that they're not the descendants, they just, you know, are sort of inspired by that. But like Carter said, they're really inspired by Marxism. Um, so yeah, that's my two cents for now. Well, they did, they definitely put, I mean, part of the book, I think does it, I think it does make the case that they put activism and political agenda before the philosophy. So it makes sense that they would cherry pick whatever they think postmodernism has said to the extent that it supports their case and reject stuff that doesn't support their case because they're not primarily uh, attempting to build philosophy. They're primarily attempting to build political activism and systems for political activism. So um, Can I jump you know, in. I, that makes sense. Yeah, please. Hi, my name is Christopher. I've been watching you guys also for about six hi, months. Hi, Christopher. Uh, hi, nice to meet you. Um, Howdy. Something that's interesting, they kind of touch on in the book is Postmodernism is supposed to be ambiguous by design. So when we're having a conversation about it right now, we don't even agree on like how it manifests itself. And I think they pretty much said like, that's one of their goals, right? So I've encountered this in conversations I've had with SJWs where you go into a conversation and you try to bring up, you know, whatever facts you have, your logic, and you're so disoriented by the conversation that you walk away thinking like, how did that even just transpire? And I think that that is one of the goals of the movement is that 
you know, anything that you thought you knew was, is totally wrong. I think that's a, I think that's a great point. And I would like to point out that, look, this is a, what, less than 300 page book aimed at the layman. You know, the, I think they did a, I think they walked right up to the edge of complexity in terms of what an average reader is going to be able to comprehend uh, having no real prior knowledge of any of this. So, uh, or wa- are they... want, want to comprehend because who wants to get more involved than this? Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, you <laughs> like... can criticize like nuance of post, well, they didn't get this exactly right. And this person actually said that and blah, blah, blah. But like, y- you know, I, it would be, it would be a lifetime's work to really dig into and expound upon all of the people they cited in this. And really, I mean, to me, this was like, this is about the right amount, about as much depth as you can expect people to consume in one sitting. And, you know, I, I think it's a little bit nitpicky to be like, well, you know, it's more, com- postmodernism is more complex than that. It's like, yeah, but the, the point of this book wasn't really about postmodernism. It was really about the the cynical theories, which they are arguing are inspired by postmodernism. And as yeah. you guys have said, cherry pick. Could I, jump in? Could I jump in with a quick uh, reference to a great analogy? I think the analogy of the root, the branch, and the fruit, I think it's page uh, somewhere, page 207, 208. He says, the three phases of postmodernism have developed. First phase, high de- deconstructive phase, that's the root trunk. The tree trunk is the Second phase from the, uh, that gave us the tree trunk, which is second phase from the 80s to the mid 2000s. And then the third phase, and then the leaves and so on. And the third phase is the fruit mid 2000s onwards, which is the era we're in now. And I think all they're really saying is, I don't think they're saying there's an exact correspondence. This led to this led to this led to this. It's just that the soil, the, 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 the root, the trunk and the leaves now give birth to this bitter, bitter fruit. That we're all tasting. I think that's what they're trying to say. Although I had to wade through a lot to get to that great analogy that they put in. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great analogy. Can I jump in? Um, they they use. Uh, um, I didn't understand this until I was talking to Caleb Beers about this because he's read a lot of Foucault, and he said that there's a point where Foucault goes, "If you try to nail me down, I'm going to be somewhere else in the argument." And we've always we've seen that is very prevalent in how we try to talk to, or it ends up being arguments, with uh, people who follow uh, social justice critique, that they do that. As soon as you pick, a, you you try to nail them down, they'll shift like, oh, uh, you're racist, so you only, you only like white people. And then when you, you prove that you don't, they'll go, oh, you're colorist or you're a fetishist of black people. And that, and that is incredibly uh, from Foucault. Like that is dramatically from Foucault. I'll say my personal social experience justice. is that that's what it's like to talk to even just postmodernists, not just social justice warriors, but postmodernists generally do do that. I think intentionally, as you're saying. There's several, things, social social justice, there's several things social justice institutionalizes that strike me as dishonest and undermining trust. One is saying one set of rules for me, one set of rules for you. Now, if you go back to say the Romans, it was very common to say, this tribe has this God and these rules and this tribe has this God and these rules and social justice with the identity politics is going back to this of you're a black woman, you have to be liberal. And if you have contrary views, you're violating the rules of the tribe and you lose the protection. So it's turning back into tribal morality, but there's also the, Bailey and Mott argument of I'm arguing this meaning of the word and I'm arguing this meaning of the world. I prove you're not, I prove I'm not personally a racist. Well, you're still a member of this cultural system that is inherently racist, so you're still this. And I had a discussion with a conservative Hispanic, John De La Rose, and he was called a white supremacist for just for defending conservative values. And he goes, excuse me, I'm brown, I'm Hispanic. And they accused him of multiracial whiteness along with uh, that Afro-Cuban proud boys guy. 
um, who's very black. I was like, you know, you're accusing the Hispanic guy of being a white supremacist because you're defending Western culture. So they're doing the, I have multiple acceptable definitions for the word and I can use this insult against you any way I want. So if I can't attack you personally, I'll attack you on the group because all of it is considered immoral, both Western civilization and white people and Judeo-Christian culture. And a lot of the postmodernism that started with critiques of the failing colonial states post-World War II turned into, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. And they took a descriptive system for what works in this culture can work in that culture with cultural relativism turned into tear down Western civilization, raise up everybody else's better. And you're not allowed to criticize these because you're the evil imperial oppressors. You're inherently bad. Everybody else is better. And it also, they added this moral framework to say, Western Civ is not just failing, it is immoral. We need to replace it with a new liberal, secular, multicultural society that denigrates what came before, tear down Western Civ, and then tear down democracy and capitalism as inherently immoral. We need a totalitarian communist, fascist, whatever economic term you'd like to use, corporatist, fascist, et cetera, system to replace the immoral political and economic system in the name of fairness. So by adding the moral framework to a descriptive social theory, it became the basis for tearing down the existing social institutions and systems. And then it also gains political power by saying, this is the moral basis to tear down your system and give us power in the name of the oppressed. I, I think that that you talking about the moral part of this belief system is really important because that was one of the through lines that I'm glad they came back to repeatedly was um, how this belief, how this is a, a, a how, how whether you call it social justice, capital SJ, like they do, or if you're talking about specific parts of it, like intersectionality or critical race theory, um, it's it became obsessed with the with what they call um, prescriptive language rather than descriptive. So instead of being concerned with what is and trying to find out what is and find truth, it's it's like a religion obsessed with morality and what ought to be. And I thought that was I thought that was great that they kept coming back to that. I have a I have a question about mm -hmm. oh, cool. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Jordan. Okay. Yeah, um, so I was, I was thinking about like, like when you're having these conversations, I, I haven't finished the book. I just heard about this. I'm, I'm several chapters in. Do they, if they, I don't know if they get to like how to have these conversations, but I was, I was wondering if uh, there's this book tactics by Kokel, if you're a Christian, it's a, an apologetics thing. Um, but one of his things that when he has conversations is to ask, um, what do you mean by that? And how did you come to that conclusion for whenever someone makes a claim? And I was wondering if would that work in a conversation like this, if to to have instead of to try and present an argument and kind of stake your claim and then have them kind of move back, you know, like or like okay, you've you've asserted your ideology and then they're going to controvert yours or contravent yours, like maybe instead of exposing your ideas or thoughts, just like kind of interrogate theirs. Is that is that a fruitful path or is it? Do they still kind of weave and subterfuge through those kind of questions. Do you mind if I respond yeah. to that, guys? Yeah, please I've, don't. Uh, I've, uh, I was even part of a um, progressive Facebook group, and I think that's how I first met Carrie through Karen, um, the smart politics. And I was actually a moderator for that group. And we did a, we did a lot of those um, techniques. We used a lot of those techniques. And the reason they asked me to be in it is because I'm much more conservative and they wanted to include other ideas and um, kind of 
fact check, not not fact check, but kind of um, ideology check to help them understand um, what people of different minds would think. Um, and I've utilized that on purpose in many, many situations. And it really depends on who you're working with here. So if you're talking to somebody who wants to score points and slam dunk you and destroy you, then it's not going to work because they tend to get incredibly defensive as opposed to trying to explore what their ideas are. Um, and I found that these concepts when it comes to the critical social justice theories are so complicated and but yet so widespread, widespread and accepted that most people are comfortable espousing these ideas and don't really have a fundamental theoretical philosophical basis for these ideas. It's almost as if they just accept these as the truth. Um, so it's it's strange because they they tend to be so um, forceful with what they say. But if you really if you get to that point where you they feel a little more comfortable and you start asking them about their beliefs and how they got, came to that. Um, and honestly, um, and nicely, and maybe even put smiley faces at the end of your quotes so they know you're not just being a jerk, um, I still find that it can be incredibly defensive for the most part because most of them start to get nervous because they can't tell you why. So anytime I find that people get nervous and get angry when you ask them, oh, you know, honestly, so what do you, why do you think that, where does that come from? I'm kind of curious. Um, it, it very often devolves, but that probably tells you that they don't themselves know. So it makes them very nervous and angry. Um, if you're lucky, you get with somebody who has some idea and really is open, it might work. But um, I found that that is incredibly rare to come across somebody like that. To build off of that too, in the book, they talk about how there's no such thing as free speech for marginalized people, right? You're just a mouthpiece for your identity. So if you try to engage with somebody and have an, an interaction as individual people, if they really buy into the ideology, they're not gonna engage in that sense because the interaction is just between some person that's more powerful trying to oppress the other person. So right. in ideology, that framework is completely different. They have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to kind of get around that, but eventually um, that's how they continue to just shut other people out that have any sort of critique of their theory. Which is why they want to score points and slam dunk and destroy you because they don't see that there is a means to come to any conclusion. Um, and I think it's, it, it, you have to also say that not everybody can think that deeply about what they're doing. And it's not like, like they're thinking, okay, you know what, this guy's trying to get power over me. So I'm going to say this. It's kind of like the, a belief system that's just a part of a culture and they act it out, even if they can't necessarily articulate it, just like many of us have belief systems that are part of our culture and we act them out and we may not be able to articulate it, but it's really deep. So it's not that I think that they're thinking all of these things strategically out, but it's kind of like mob rule. And when, when they get together, um, all of these ideas kind of come out in their actions. Um, and I, I do think a lot of them don't necessarily, they're not necessarily um, doing this as a trying to be mean and trying to be angry or whatever. They're, they just um, are acting out what they deeply don't understand. Yeah, let, can I just jump in there too to add something to that? Um, I'm a pastor. I deal with a lot of pastors. I'm mostly mentoring pastors. And what I've watched is this massive, massive divide in the church right now. And what I'm finding is that even within the church, there's a lot of people who have the same theology, but very often someone uh, buying into the sort of mantras of the culture right now with social justice, what they tend to do is they will take a little bit of Christian theology it's like I call it a social justice sandwich, a little bit of Christian theology, a big bunch of social justice meat in the middle, and then a little bit of Christian theology to, buy, to sell you the sandwich. But the actual theology contradicts the meat in the middle. And I think that's where a lot of people are. I'm seeing this in the church all over, especially amongst leaders, sadly, is where their own belief system ought to lead them to either 
outright reject or at least nuance, at least push into, press into, uh, be willing to see two sides of the issue. But sadly, um, because the religious mantras in the culture at large are so dominant, these discussions quickly turn to two people arguing with each other rather than really, for example, as a Christian pastor, I would say, look at your faith, read the text, read the Bible, look at the central doctrines of the Bible. They, they, they stand in opposition to this at almost every major point, but you can't make much headway with that. I've discovered no matter how hard I try, uh, the mantras, the, the cultural mantras are so dogmatic they are like an alternative religion right now. And it's very hard making headway. Um, I yeah, like I, can I just let Dangerosa Jones jump in? Cause she's, he or she has raised, raised his or her hand. I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know the gender of Dangerosa. Uh, you jumping in or no? Oh, yep. There we go. Hopefully. One second. You're there. You're muted, you're muted. Okay, you're good. Now you're muted. Now yeah, you're right. I, think I, I think I know okay. the gender now. We're gonna go with we're gonna go with she. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> now, now, I, now that I see you, I yes. know I know your gender. Um, if I'm allowed to. Well, I was gonna just I was gonna say, it's important to remember too that as human beings, we psychologically have this thing called the default to truth. We want to believe what people tell us. So they wanted to believe, and they did. And the fact that you are not believing because they're saying it is extremely upsetting to them. <laughs> yeah, can I can I talk to that? Yeah. Um, Cecil, I, hey Carter, hey Carrie, hey Cecil. Uh, yeah. It's Hi. Great to actually, actually see you guys. Um, yeah, I've been I've been thinking about this a lot too, and you know we talk about Foucault and, and postmodernism. And, postmodernism in there. Hey, Cecil, can you speak up? Because you're really low to me. I don't know if you're low to everyone else, but. You hear, is that better? If I take the headphones out, does that do anything? Maybe, or just, yeah, or just speak loudly. It's fine. Okay. Um, I feel like there's, there's a struggle that every human being goes through where you're trying to come to some conclusion about the nature of the universe and what meaning is and what we're all doing here. And I feel like the postmodernists, you know, they came to the conclusion that, that there's no meaning and that's, and that's fine. A lot of people do, or, you know, a lot of people can make that academic argument. Um, but I think once you hit that point, whatever that point is, I think you're also given the choice to still be grateful for existence to, um, to find some sort of appreciation for, what it is that's around you, the life that you've lived, et cetera. And, um, and I think that it, it seems like the postmodernists chose not to be grateful for that. And so that overall kind of mindset about life and reality, then even though it was perhaps simply an academic thing, then promulgated through all of these other academic things that as they talked about in the book were much more engaging because, because they suggested that people go out and do things about these various pieces of avenues of study. Um, and so I, you know, I, I feel like we're dealing with the natural human inclination to, to be cynical, to be like, what the hell's going on in life? Why are we all here? Um, and, and a series of texts that are telling you, yes, it's okay. You should conclude that there's no meeting. You should conclude that you've been put upon by the world and that the system is the whole reason that that you're feeling upset or that you're anxious or whatever, instead of saying, hey, <laughs> everybody's anxious, everybody struggles in life. Um, there are various religions and things out there that allow you to have like a better conceptualization of, of why it is we might all be here. But ultimately we as humans can very easily get pulled into this kind of negative spiral. And, uh, and yeah, I, I think so. We're, we're dealing with a group of people who have been encouraged to conclude that everything is terrible. And that is like a reinforcement of a natural human inclination, except they're being told by everybody else that that's just fine. <laughs> and so, you know, it's a, we're just in a, in a state where it's like most religions are encouraging you to find the best, to 
achieve the best to to push yourself in the direction of that which is holy or whatever you conclude and i feel like this is is essentially saying hey no everybody's shit and um and the whole system is against you and you should feel terrible about it and you should be enraged and so yeah so i i'm, I'm not even sure if that was the original goal of the postmodernists I'm, I'm i like eastern religion so you know you'll read the Tao and you'll you'll see how they have a tough time concluding about meaning or words or that kind of thing. But ultimately, um, I think we're in this cycle where it's like there's now a system that encourages, even if it's not doing it consciously, encourages people to double down on their negativity. That's a great point. I, I'll yeah. just jump in real fast as they, and they come back to it quite often. And that was something I experienced in it and observed is that it's relentless. The fight is never over. They say they believe racism is permanent, sexism is permanent, and that you're constantly having to look at everything. You know, that quote that's in here about where they say it's not if racism occurred, it's it's how did it manifest? <laughs> so that's a great point. I'll, I'll be quiet. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad agree. they brought in the, the coddling of the American mind book because it 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 meshes with what you're saying, I think, which is like there's this. uh this I won't say bad psychology, but a certain a certain psychological outlook is uh, works hand in hand with an ideology that encourages that psychological outlook, and that you end up in this kind of psychological spiral fueled by both intellectual justification for it and your feelings uh, then justify the intellect, and that, that kind of you go down this spiral. Um, we have three people who raised their hands. I want to give them a chance to speak. The the first one I see is Sam. Uh, hold the brill. Sam, if you want to unmute your mic and speak. Yeah. So I, I think we should let the other people probably speak first because my points are a lot more broad in general. So. All right. Well, we got Victor and Kyle. We can come back to you, Sam. Uh, Victor, you want to you wanna go next? How do I raise my hand? Sure, yeah. You're um, good. Hi from the future. I mean, Australia, it's seven in the morning. Oh, fun day here. Um, yeah, reading this book uh, made me think a lot about um, Jonathan Hyde's uh, other book, um, uh, The Righteous Mind, and uh, the concept of the elephant and its, uh, and its rider. And uh, reading about uh, postmodernism and their ideas uh, gives me the, the sense that this kind of cultural movement has uh, made acceptable to think like a teenager with a um, average, average AQ and a lot of ideas and no uh, experience of the world and uh, encourage a, a psychopathic kind of uh, approach to, to the truth. And um, yeah, I found a, a interesting a point that Kat uh, hammers on quite a lot uh, about uh, what the left sees the language, how the left sees the language. Uh, page 177, there's this uh, quote, oh, okay. But to uphold the rigor of scientific convention limits engagement with meaning making. Language is not a neutral tool, but rather a powerful charge of political vector. The words that we use here influence our ability to create possibilities. And uh, this is quite telling. It's uh, absolutely cynical and psychopathic. And uh, that is okay for someone who is 14 and uh, wants to, you know, go about his life and uh, achieve something. But to make it acceptable by using uh, postgraduate language uh, is, is quite a criminal. And my, if you want criticism of this book, uh, would be that... It takes for granted that uh, liberalism and uh, this kind of phenomenon are uh, antithetical. Um, I would say that they are embedded, at least postmodernism is uh, endemic to the idea, the ideas of liberalism, because the liberalism, whatever it is, it doesn't have the antibodies to, uh, to fight this, because having um, freedom of speech as a first principle, uh, opens uh, opens the floodgates for any any kind of uh, speech, and uh, also to the destruction of, of speech. Um, what was the yeah? Uh, my comment more later, but these are my main points. Aside from the you reminding uh, me what 
Yeah. You're reminding me of what Yuri Bresmanov said about our Bezmanov said about uh, <laughs> the Soviets and how they they viewed the um, the liberalism of the West as a as a as a a bug that they could exploit that free speech um, w- was inherently a bug because it allowed them to uh, promulgate ideas that undermined free speech itself and <laughs> and everything else. I don't know how the answer to that, but uh, I think it's a it's a common struggle, which is if you have all of this freedom, it does mean that people can arise pushing really bad ideas that ultimately undermine all of the the liberty that you're. Um, that you're valuing. I think the next person in our queue is Kyle. Kyle, do you want to? And then, and then after Kyle, I just want to make sure you get to Philip because he was having trouble raising his hand. Oh, okay. Yeah. We'll do Philip after Kyle. All right. Let's see. Is my mic working? Uh, you're a little let's, bit, a uh, little bit weird. Let's. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. Um, so I actually, interestingly both um, Sam and Victor raised things similar to what um, I've been thinking about. Um, I read uh, Max Stirner, who's one of the like proto postmodernists. And one of the things that I think is helpful from him to understand like the postmodern truth principle is Stirner draws the line between absolute truth, which he does believe exists and my truth, which is like that, which I know and which is useful to me. And so what the postmodern truth principle sort of does is it gets rid of the absolute truth of that. Not so much that they necessarily have to deny that it exists, but they deny that it's relevant in any way. So even if there is an absolute objective reality, no one's living up to it and it doesn't matter. Um, And so when you think about it that way, it's like, well, you know, if, if they bring up like in a discussion, whether objective truth really exists, it's a red herring. Like if it does or it doesn't is entirely irrelevant to them because they're only interested in the utilitarian truth, um, which Stirner would hate, but you don't have to live in accordance with your forefathers. Um, and the other thing is um, within liberalism, I've noticed like there are different intellectual strands some of which are more vulnerable to this sort of thing than others. Like if you had like a Tolstoyan or someone who's like a libertarian, they probably have a different way of approaching this whole social justice theory, the critical theory stuff, because they have a different view of the individual. And so when you have like that sort of more individualist approach, where the reason why we have liberalism is to protect individuals. So like if you go back to even like Locke or someone who's really old in the liberal tradition, they seem to have much better answers than like if you were reading like Rawls, you know, who would have this like, well, but really for equality, we need to make sure that everyone's starting from a similar place. And it's like, well, but, you know, if you do that, you can start making up all these reasons about why, we need to alter the laws to not be fully equal versus if you have someone who's either totally individualistic or individualistic as a end goal, you get a very different reading. And so, yeah, like, sorry, go ahead. Like even like Karl Popper, who I think would, if you actually read Karl Popper, he has some great ideas against the sort of cynical theory stuff of like, we should all do this. But of course, I think most people have seen that meme of Karl Popper's paradox of tolerance where they've totally like reversed it. And it's like, well, read what Karl Popper has to say about Hegel. And, you know, the way that he talks about, you know, sort of platonic lies and whatnot. And you get the sense that he's much more a conservative than a liberal in that sense. Yeah. I think you're, you're hitting on something that uh, we don't have to get into too much, but, uh, I, I view as a, it makes me uncomfortable when we throw the word liberalism around and say that's what we're kind of supporting because I, although I do and I, I agree with it, I think it's kind of a very broad brush. And like you're saying, I don't, there does, there's not a, um, I don't think there's a clear defined agreed upon ethic around which 
that 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 is that we can call as the liberal ethic that is okay um this is what individual rights mean this is why they are valued that these are the values that it, the, the values that liberalism seems to hold are kind of secondary they're well people we want liberty and uh we want individual rights generally but they don't it, there's not a there's not a real firm ethical agreed upon foundation for a lot of that so you do have different factions arguing about what that means and um and i think that's one of the vulnerabilities and i, I you know I, I think when when religion was torn down and replaced with nothing there wasn't a lot of atheist philosophers who said well let's go back and try and build the ethical and moral structure that's required to to um justify individual rights and the the kind of foundation of of the west uh, which is maybe why we're in the place we are now i don't know uh let's let's move to philip because i know you've been waiting philip uh you can unmute yourself and and speak um okay can you hear me now hello no nothing yeah i hear you i hear you i do okay um Oh, this is a long time ago. We were talking about what do you say to people when they come at you and uh, start trying to describe, uh, you know, they're, they're telling you about their beliefs and how do, how do we respond in the best way so that sort of we can be heard or that it doesn't turn into this sort of like people passing each other or a cat fight or whatever. And uh, I'm definitely, this is not an area of, my, of strong competence for me, uh, but I think we're all weak on this. Like, what do we... Uh, say, and I think you really need to differentiate. It's the most like important thing that we can really learn to do is like how to respond so that we can uh, stop the onslaught and uh, sort of create a holding action where more conversation can take place. Um, but uh, we really need to differentiate between like, what's the situation? Is this an online forum where we're talking about ideas and exchanging opinions? Or is this a practical situation, an institution of some sort? Like I'm, my, my daughter's about to start kindergarten next year. And so I'm thinking about attending the PTA meetings and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, that's a situation where it's practical. I have a stake in it. This is, uh, we, we, we all have uh, presumed shared goals. Um, so, those will be very different situations, uh, one from the other. You know, if it's a, a knitting club, or if it's a university, or if it's like your, you know, a, a primary school. And so, yeah, I, I one of the things that I feel like I've when I've run through the conversations at the imaginary PTA meetings is to say something like, um, "Well, that's debatable." I know that sounds silly, but like you don't hit them with all the things you want to say you just show them, first of all, the like, mm, I'm not fully won over to your point. Like you're shooting over there, but I'm just still here listening to you. I'm like, mm, not sure about that. Or I don't see that. Or even, I don't think the statistics bear that out. Don't tell them what the statistics do say, because then you're already like hitting them with stuff and you guys are going to be in a crossfire. Uh, there's sort of a, a line in the movie, The Sum of All Fears, where, uh, you know, Ben Affleck's like, oh, you're going to tell them about whatever. And he says, uh, Morgan Freeman says, oh, I'm not going to tell them. I'm going to tell them what I'm going to tell them. Then I'm going to tell them. So in other words, you have to hit, you have to prep people for like a horizon, you know, or like you have to prep people to, to, to receive an argument. You can't just hit them with an argument, especially people who are not used to negotiating differences of opinion. So anyway, in terms of figuring out what do we say to people when we get into a, a tangle, uh, if you're in a practical situation, an institutional context, remember, you have a stake in it. It does matter what happens. So you have a right to speak in a way that an online forum is more like a kind of like, eh, whatever, like people will believe one thing or they'll believe another. It doesn't matter to me what you think. Uh, whereas what another parent insists on or what a teacher insists on in a school context matters. Um, and try to say just sort of like, mm, I'm not sure I see that. Anyway, our shared goals are to make sure the kids come out of here with writing, reading, and arithmetic, or whatever it is, and just revisit the, the shared grounds. Uh, and if they say, well, wait, what do you think? You know, well, well, hold on a second. You're saying that you can't, you shouldn't believe trans people, or you're saying that there isn't racism? Like, then they're basically begging you to, to explain your point of view. And at that point, you've created a very different dynamic than just firing back at them right away. That's a that's a great point. 
I love that. And it also, uh, Philip makes me think of the part where they're saying like liberalism is you have an obligation to listen and consider, but we don't have an obligation to listen and believe. And, you know, that listen and believe some, somehow we've, we've, we've lost, uh, we've lost the ability or the courage to say, yes, I can listen to you. And I can also evaluate what you're saying and say, I don't agree with that. Or as you're saying, that's debatable. Um, I'm still listening. I'm, I'm willing to listen, but I don't have to, I don't have to believe that's fundamentalism to say, I have to believe. Yep. Motown. Uh, I think you're next on the queue from what I can tell you want to speak. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of good points made. Um, so uh, I'm just going to make my own then. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, number one, Lindsay has a great article called The Woke Won't Debate You, um, which is, which when I saw the title, I thought, oh, because they won't debate you because they can't win because they have no ev- their, you know, what, what evidence and whatever. But it's really about how they all think. Like if they debate you on your terms, then they're complicit in uh, you know the structural oppression and all that stuff. So uh, it's a really good read for you to kind of get out of the, well, if I just give them my evidence, like for us as classical liberals, I'm assuming most of us are in a very loose sense of the word, um, uh, you know, we have to actually think outside of our, um, outside of our liberal, like giving them, you know, the benefit of the doubt and, and all that stuff. Um, that's just one point. Um, my second point is sort of to steel man postmodernism, which I know nothing about except for like recently. Like I don't know anything about philosophy. I'm a geeky, like I'm a pro- programmer. I'm a math guy. I'm not a philosophy guy. Um, but uh, um, from what I've understood, okay, um, Lindsay says that reality is what you hate, what your ideology runs up, like runs out, right? When your ideology doesn't work, that you've hit reality. So, but Michael Malice, who is an authority on North Korea, he said that you think Kim Jong Un is the leader of North Korea, but what he's actually is is he's riding a tiger, and what he's doing is he's trying to make sure that tiger is eating everyone else like not him right but the tiger will will eventually eat him like kim jong-un can't just turn his place into a democracy because the people will will savage him right like he's riding a tiger okay that's not excusing kim jong-un or anything i'm just saying it's more nuanced than that now that's an authoritarian culture with a you know like a leader at top when you talk about a western democracy which is much more decentralized right then Oh, so my point about North Korea before I go there was just that you think Kim Jong Un's a leader. He's not, right? He's not the leader. He doesn't control everything. He can't turn it into a democracy because it will destroy him, like physically. The people will tear him apart. Capital. So you could say that there's like social, you know, you could say there's languages, right? Like how the postmodernists talk. The language is controlling it. There's or there's like discourses or whatever that are controlling that. Now, capitalism, which is much more decentralized, right? You could say with with that, that it's also a, you know, it's also a, a discourse kind of thing um, within reality. I'm saying if, you, if you're within the bounds of reality, postmodernism sort of works. Like, you know, if you have a, if you have a job and you stub your toe in the morning and you're in a bad mood, you might do something or den- deny someone something in your job or something and sort of create like a small reality that you wouldn't do had you not stubbed your toe and been in a bad mood. So, you know, I'm saying like, if we're going to argue against postmodernism, we have to understand that there is some truth in it, which Lindsay says, which is that within the bounds of reality, you can create like, you can shape you know, the, the conversation and stuff. I'm not sure exactly where I'm going with that, <laughs> but that is, you know, it's sort of like the, it's sort of like the emperor is not wearing clothes and everyone knows he's not wearing clothes, but you know, you can't see he's not wearing clothes because then you'll be executed. So, 
So you have to believe the emperor is wearing clothes just to function in the society. But, you know, maybe uh, uh, like, right? Like science is data and, and how we use science is our interpretation of the data, right? So um, that's, I don't know, those are sort of disconnected thoughts, but it's just, you know, there is truth within postmodernism. You know, the problem is when, when they say two plus two equals five, which is potentially ridiculous. But, um, uh, you know, you just gotta think deeper if you're really going to get to the truth of the matter of how to counter you know, these radicals and these moms. So, well, well I don't, I don't want to speak of... for James, but I, I don't, I think he would say, at least based on my reading of the book, he, he and Helen might say something like, well, there might be some, some uh, ways of looking at things in postmodernism and even in, in critical theories that are valuable, but those aren't unique to postmodernism or critical theories. And, uh, you can use liberal uh, actual reality correspondence techniques that aren't corrupt philosophically to do the same thing and have a similar analysis. Um, so like when you talk about, well, you stub your toe and you create your own little reality. Well, it's not really necessary to use languages like you've created your own reality. We can talk about psychology and we can talk about how, you know, people's psychology affects, you know, their, their behavior and language affects other people's psychology. And you can set up dynamics between two people. You can have that entire conversation about that dynamic and everything that happens around it without any postmodernism. Postmodernism doesn't add anything. It just takes one aspect that can be treated through rational liberal uh, thought and and make that its entire world and then discards the, the pillars and foundations of actual reality correspondence. So um, I, I again, I'm not trying to put words in their mouth, but I think that's how they would look at it based on the book. Based, based on well, the book. Also, just I just want to highlight page 251 which you made me think of both of you, but they, you know, they start off by saying, and I appreciated this. They said, how then do we counter the postmodern principles and themes simply and confidently and show any waivers that liberal ideas should win out in the intellectual marketplace. We can start by acknowledging what theory gets right. And, and I like that approach. And then they go through and they do that. Um, I like that approach because in any conversation, I mean, just practically when you're having a disagreement with someone, I find it really useful to find out, to, to dig all the way down and find out what are your points of agreement first, because then you can talk about your departure. Yeah. I think next is uh, Marie Buskey. So uh, Marie, jump in. Hi. Hi, Marie. Hi. Hi. Look, one of the things I loved about this book was, I think what Carter brought up before, about how it was written very much for a lay person going in. And so often, and I know in the experiences I've had in the last few years, I have so many people come to me um, just all of a sudden slightly getting an inkling of what's going on. And where this book was really useful for me is it lay out all the foundations that brought us to this critical, this theory or social justice ideology of today, and what a sort of a Frankenstein, Mary Shelley sort of a monster that has taken, um, I think, as Mo said, they've cherry picked all the pieces that suit them in order to create this theory moving forward. And what I loved is as they move through all the different elements of modern theory and how it actually applies to the world that they see it at the moment, is when they wrapped it up at the end, they talked about um, a group of people, which I definitely think that I fell into or I sat in, who are people that um, believe very much in how you can actually operate as an individual, what it is that I can do to make a difference to the world, as opposed to theory that spends all its time trying to find somebody else to blame for what is going on. And so, what I saw was this whole movement of how a, a lay person that really doesn't understand what goes on could be lured in to the path of good intentions that they have, like Black Lives Matter, little b, but little l, little m versus capitals on the other side. Or they had this manipulation of language, how they think, well, yes, I, I all, I'm all for equality, 
not realizing that what the language now is is equity and they're two very different things so they fall down the, you know they go down this path of good intentions and they're drawn in by the candy of all these wonderful promises that they are actually doing right th the right things because that's what human nature has them to do but those are the ones that often that you can reach that you can actually talk to and say well actually let's pull that back a little bit you know are you are you aware that this may actually necessarily mean this so the book provided you with tools and talking points for those people at the group at the end the community at the end who I think a large number of people are really quite ambivalent you know they really are completely aware of what's going on like they may have a spidey sense that stuff is different they're seeing things happening out there and what this book I think is a great tool is that you can start conversations to those people they haven't yet started down that social justice or theory path they're noticing that something's going on and they don't necessarily like it and those are the conversations that you can have with them and say well actually this is what's going on and this is what's happening out here and actually you know it comes down to you know how can you make the world a better place as you as the individual or do you look at the world and say it's everyone else's problem and actually other people need to do this and other people need to do that and how other people think are actually going to be changing things or um, affecting things. And I think that group, I think if you are able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with those people, that is where your change is going to come because they're the big group in the middle. They're the ones that politically have been left out of this is, you know, the Overton window has sort of had the seismic shift left and they've been stretched out and they're sitting in the middle really quite bewildered about where things are at. And I love the fact that they started the book with an introduction of where things are at. This is how things are at the moment and breaking down all the different elements of theory. And these are the people here that you're talking to. So if you start a conversation with someone, I now feel quite confident that I can say, actually, I've got this book. Why don't you read this book? Because, you know, it's a bit heavy going at the beginning, but chew through it and actually explains everything that's going on right now and if you've got any questions come and talk to me and I think you know sometimes you have to start with a single brick and a single foundation in order to make things better and make things change yeah I completely agree I was thinking of people as I read the book that I was like I should give yeah. this to this person or I should give this book to this person because yeah. they're they're sincere and they're interested but they don't they don't really know and they're just throwing their hat in with the crowd because that seems to be the thing to do. Um, and they look at me a little bit weird that I'm not doing that. And so uh, I think the book is, a, is great for that exact reason. Yeah. Thank you. And when, they, and when they say to you, why, Oh, you don't agree with that. Why is that? It's like, well, I'm glad you asked me that question. Here's a couple of reasons why. And I know one of the things that, that I've had this conversation a lot in recent months and um, equity versus equality. I find if you're looking for an opening um, part of a conversation to have, that I find is a really, really good one to have, particularly in the light of the uh, Martin Luther King's birthday that was just had last week, you know, Everybody, when you talk to them, they all believe in equality. You know, they have this uh, foundational moral sense that for a number of them has been right throughout their, their lives or their childhoods and beyond. And they believe that these new movements, this is what they're after. And actually, as we all know, they're not. So that is, a, a, you know, if you're looking for a place to start, I think it's great. And I have gotten to a point now, I have, as Carrie and Carter know, I've been fighting with my social justice fan club now for a number of years. I don't, I just don't even bother anymore. They're in the review. I, as far as I'm concerned, if someone has a, an actual valid question they want to ask me or something they want to bring up, then I'll engage in a conversation. For me, it's this big group in the middle who have all of a sudden particularly with the political changes that are happening right around the world with COVID, not just in the United States, but, you know, I know there's huge politi political movements and changes in most of the Western world. Those are the ones that all of a sudden it is actually starting to, to, to wake them up a little bit or they're at least having an awareness. So those are the ones I think that we can all talk to. We all have them in our lives and our families. And this book gives us a roadmap to actually help us guide, guide ourselves through those conversations. Do you mind if I respond to what she said? I, Marie, I really love the way you put that and really articulate it. I, I, I should, uh, I would love to see that as a clip for instructional instructions on the manner in which we um, engage with these conversations. And I think an important point to remember is 
um, what Marie was saying is there's a big group of people that are probably open to this. And it's very easy though, for us to get caught up in the people saying the most ridiculous things and getting into these matches with them. And um, what Marie reminds me of is that those aren't the people who we should spend that much time on because they're not interested in anything but the battle itself. They may not understand the um, theoretical underpinnings anyways, and they may just have a resentful heart that is looking for a tool in which to um, lash out. So, you know, don't be mean to them, don't be rude to them, but I think it's, uh, it's probably better not to engage them nearly as much as we do sometimes, even though it could kind of be fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, letting those nails out, Carrie. <laughs> and uh, I, I get like, caught up in that stuff all the time. Are but... my ears burning? Mine are. <laughs> <laughs> but the, yeah, and I get caught up too. So I, I think it's a good point to make sure we think about who it is that we want to have these discussions with. Can I jump in real quick? Because uh, the, the point I wanted to raise earlier is like, exactly responding to this uh, point that Thomas just made. Um, so, and, and, and it's responding to the, one of the points that Thomas was raising earlier about, you know, you know, the very often the people who we're going to be engaged with, if we're having these disagreements are not, you know, their conclusions are not the output of some carefully constructed rational argument. It's they're, they're parroting some talking points that they've heard and they don't know how to de defend the position when it's subject to legitimate criticism. And then so often this results in a kind of insecurity that results in name calling and people can end up in screaming matches. So, so that's a really good point. Um, and it, it relates to one of the, the problems I have with the way that the book, the book is framed because the book is framed as uh, you know, all of these problems that we face in society now that we see on the level of just everyday political discourse, as well as on uh, university campuses and social justice activism, is that it actually comes from the academy, that these ideas have their origins in scholarship. And through the teaching of these ideas, they get passed on into uh, the next generation of students and that the actual scholarship itself is what is, because that's, that's what the book's claim is, is that actually the scholars themselves are making these claims, these very crazy claims, right? Uh, you know, these, you know, uh, all white people are racist, all men are sexist, et cetera, et cetera. No room for disagreement, right? That's where they end up claiming that it's all on the basis of this scholarship. And my overarching critique of the book is that they don't demonstrate with the one exception, the one strong exception of Robin D'Angelo. And now you can look at Ibram Kendi who, whose work wasn't out for them to write about, but who has similar issues in his scholarship now. But with the exception of Robin D'Angelo, none of the scholars, almost none, there's, the, there's a few things about research justice in the post-colonial chapters as well, but I wish that they had just framed this book as like, here's these problems that people are either finding rationalizations of in scholarship without actual, without real justification or, or just said, hey, look, people, you know, completely misread Kimberly Crenshaw's conception of intersectionality and have misunderstood her completely, which they actually note in the end notes. But the narrative of the book is like, oh, well, this is just the, the development of the intellectual history and the genealogy goes like this and the people interpret this and this is how you get to Robin DiAngelo. And that's where the social justice activism, the extremism all comes from. But everyone's, everyone's you know, when, when people really identify with this book, it's not about something that they read in an academic journal. It's about some conversation they had with someone where they saw some woke gone wrong, some social justice extremism. And so I just don't understand why they felt the need to frame it in terms of it resulting from the scholarship when the only scholar that, when I you know, went through the book and did my fact checking, 
actually made these wild claims was Robin D'Angelo. So sorry for the long rant. I just do you not do you not think that they um I, no, I'm glad you're here and, and have some, it's always better when we have disagreement, otherwise it'd be very boring. I have a, a question. Do you not think that they adequately though uh, tried to explain that, that the, they use the word mutation, for example, that these ideas, like we mentioned before, borrow what they want from postmodernist scholars and then oh, mutate yeah. and, okay. <clears throat> No, but, they, so they, they, they definitely that. make it clear okay. that there's a, there's a transformation in each stage from the original postmodernist to the applied postmodernist to the reified postmodernist. It's just that uh, it's, it, with especially, this is, I mean, I wrote a review people can look up. It's called The Cynical Theorists Behind Cynical Theories, where in which I focus on chapter eight and social justice scholarship, reified postmodernism, where they cite almost exclusively philosophers, uh, academic philosophers working in social epistemology primarily, uh, some of whom are actually my, my professors. Um, and they, they butcher a lot of them, their, their interpretations of them. They, they just either are inaccurate. They don't give page numbers for most of the claims that are raised. They just sort of say, oh, this is said in this article. This is said in this article. And it's, it's, it's really bad. <laughs> the I have to disagree with uh, what Sam is saying. I mean, the idea that Foucault, uh, you said at the very beginning, oh, nobody says there's no such thing as objective reality. Um, but what Foucault does is he brings, you know, like a lot of modern philosophers since Kant, we stop looking at object objectivity at the object and we start looking at the subject. What are the categories by which we uh, can sort of synthesize and make this world that we apprehend. Uh, that's what Kant's project was. Of course, he thought that those categories were universal to all human beings. And so there wasn't much of a problem, even though we couldn't know the object as it was in itself, we all shared the same subject of categories. So fine, we'll come to agreement. Foucault is saying something similar. He calls it the episteme, which he describes as a grid, which makes certain ideas appear and certain ideas invisible. Um, and of course, not what he not, says. Grid, hold on, this grid is not universal among all human beings. It belongs either to an age or in the subsequent, right. uh, uh, what's it called, iterations, belongs to a culture or to a community, to some smaller group than humanity as a whole. Um, so the idea with all of this, like we sort of have like a, a grid or a, an episteme which allows certain things to appear or not appear, um, and we have certain uh, ways in which we justify, which do not have to do with something really being justified, but simply this is how a given, uh, oh, I don't know, profession justifies something with it having no uh, larger implications for anybody else. It's just particular to them is that it makes us think, oh, wow, like nothing is ever really justified. It's sort of just like this community says it's justified or this profession says it's justified or it's justified because only because we have this historically conditioned at the steam, which uh, doesn't allow us really to consider all of the relevant things. Uh, so when Foucault was challenged by uh, historians and uh, philosophers on his works, he did deny that there is any such thing as justification. Justification is justification, meaning something that is historically conditioned, belongs to a certain group, belongs to a certain community. And therefore, what people take away, because you seem to be thinking, oh, well, they haven't read it carefully enough, but people never read anything carefully enough. They take away a derivative version of whatever it is. So when they read that or see, see that, they're like, oh, justification isn't really universal. It simply belongs to a given community. And if you're not in that community, you don't subscribe to it. Uh, it doesn't have any relevance to you. Um, and so it makes all justification seem like a kind of like, well, no, that's just how you think of it. You validate things. Um, and I, since I don't want to accept that conclusion, must belong to a different community. You know, It's your positionality that determines whether you accept something or don't accept something else. So he did deny that there was any meaningful way in which we justify uh, knowledge, meaning knowledge without quotations and justify without quotations. And I don't have James' book or uh, David Macy's book or Alan Ryan's book, all of which I've read multiple times, 
or the you know uh, text and uh, Alan Ryan's book, a third made up of long quotes. I've read plenty of them. So, um, you so I want to allow because I can tell Sam wants to rebut this. And I do want to allow you a little space to do that. We also still have a lot of people who haven't yeah. spoken yet. So yeah. if you want to just, if quick. you have a rebuttal quick, and then we'll go to some people who haven't talked. I would just say quickly read chapter uh, six of part four, the, the last two chapters of this book, science and knowledge and the conclusion from the archaeology of knowledge. I was reviewing it this morning. None of those claims are in Foucault. Foucault has been misread by many people. You know, but I'm not interested in, in talking about Foucault at, at this moment. I, I brought up the, the uh, problems I have with their reading of the original postmodernists earlier. Uh, the thing I was focusing on this point is their discussion of the contemporary philosophers in the third wave of postmodern theory that they're discussing, reified postmodernism or social justice scholarship, that they say they start with the discussion of Miranda Fricker and her discussion of epistemic injustice. Then they go on, they talk about epistemic violence and epistemic oppression with Christy Dotson. Their misrepresentation of Christy Dotson is particularly egregious. Uh, again, you can read my critique of it. I'll, I'll put a link of it in here. Uh, but all you need to really do, in my opinion, is go to the end notes and notice how little, how few page numbers there are in reference to these articles that they're giving citations of. They're, they're making specific claims. They should be able to cite specific page numbers where these claims are made, but, but that it does not show up in the citations. You have to ask why that is, given th there are texts that they have obviously read carefully when they're taking uh, particular quotes from, especially, you know, the, the, it's usually the secondary literature that they're taking particular quotes from. They give particular page numbers. You have to ask why they don't in other cases. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think we've got, I'm going to start, start asking other people to speak here. Um, I do, I do want to say really quickly though. Um, I think one of the problems that we've got is there's, I mean, the volume of material to, to go through and, uh, and, and, and comprehend. I mean, if you look at the claim that ideas are coming not from academia seems hard to support from for me. Like clearly they're coming from academia. We all see, we all observe these ideas coming from campuses into mainstream. So if some if the campuses have intentionally if if current professors have intentionally misread Crenshaw or Foucault or anyone else, uh, it's kind of a moot point. I mean, uh, and a lot of these people, especially the postmodernist people, intentionally write in very uh, perverse and incomprehensible ways. And so the idea that like nitpicking them for like, well, you're summarizing Foucault, but you didn't really understand this nuance. It's like, well, no one's meant to understand the nuance. It's kind of a pile of crap. And that's the point. The point is- They should just say that then. They should just say that then. That maybe. Um, but, you know, I, I think, I you know, I, I don't think they, I mean, I don't know. I've read, I've read Kimberly Crenshaw and I don't think they misrepresented her too much. I mean, they did mention that the intersectionality metaphor is misapplied, I think, as you, as you pointed out. So um, anyway, se separate debate, but I, I actually, I do think if you put the link up, um, I'll put the link in the show notes. Cause I would love to have people be able to read your critique. I think that's totally cool. So send us the link and we'll put your critique up there so people can get a more full picture of what you're saying. Um, Catherine and Tim, I think it's I think you're next on deck by my count here. Do you guys want to hop in? <clears throat> yeah, so um, um, this actually goes back a little bit to what Maria was saying about um, like uh, the difference between individual responsibility and just casting blame on like uh, a whole group of people. So uh, on page 13 of uh, the book, um, he quotes, or he, uh, he at least talks about, uh, John Rawls opinion. He says, uh, so a quote from the book is, uh, in this, he set out a universalist thought experiment in which a socially just society would be one in which an individual given a choice would be equally happy to be born in 
into any such any social milieu or identity group. So basically what he's saying is like, well, if you had to define like what is social justice, a lot of people don't know how to define it. But he's saying one possible definition is that anybody would be equally happy to be, to be born in any social milieu or, or identity group. And I was just thinking, well, how could you achieve that? And uh, actually, I think uh, if, you, if you're equally happy to be born in any of these um, social or identity groups, when it seems to me that that saying is like you're born to parents who uh, appreciate and accept uh, and support the individuality of, of, of children and also the individuality of everybody else, the uniqueness of everybody uh, and their own identities and, 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 and support them in their own version of success, et cetera. Um, it seems like this would enable anyone to be, like if all parents did that, then it doesn't matter where you're born or, or who your identity is, you'd be able to be happy. Um, this is re without regard to, again, you know, identity group, you know, it doesn't matter, or like social status or even like wealth status um, or, you know, uh, anywhere in the world, even uh, if you're born with uh, kind of, if you're growing up with a community, especially parents, though, who do appreciate uh, the individuality, then, um, then you can be happy anywhere. And I think that, like, I think the social justice kind of would then be, like, if everyone treated each other like that, that would probably be um, achieving social justice, which is actually not at all what social justice warriors actually, you know, want. That's not at all their, their agenda. They don't focus on the individual and their responsibility to uh, accept everybody's like, uniqueness and <clears throat> they just say, you do you. That's not the same thing at all. Uh, that's uh, uh, indifference as opposed to love. And so um, I think they're actually, they're barking up the wrong tree um, with regard to, regard to this. It sounds like you're saying that the best good you can do in the world might be uh, on an individual level and the things that you can control, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah like uh, basically changing yourself and, and, and improving your own character and, uh, and, and trying to find, you know, correct principles and everything and, and live accordingly. Uh, that, 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 and then enabling other people to do the same. So... Uh, and 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 co cooperating with everybody. In other words, um, <clears throat> like win-win, uh, trying to develop win-win alternatives uh, in the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. He talks a lot about stuff like this. Cool. Thank you. Um, I think I think next on my list is Zach Russell. Zach, do you want to? Hey. Okay. Yeah. So going back a couple minutes to what Marie said, she's like, I'm, I'm so glad for this book that's put all this in layman's terms. And I'm like, you guys are on like a different planet to me because this is like so <laughs> out of my league at times. Like it's so <laughs> academic. And that's why I'm at university today. <laughs> like it is very academic. I will say it's the most like Carter said, it's a good balance between though. I think it's the most it's the furthest. What did you say, Carter? It gets right up to the edge of being too academic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I for me, I read it and I'm like, because I've definitely read harder to digest books that were more academic but this was on that threshold of like i don't know if they got any deeper if they got any more specific, like if they if they really dived in a little anymore i think it would just lose people it kept a good pace for me it was like okay like it's an overview there's a lot to cover um you know maybe some of uh uh the sam's criticisms are valid like i didn't look at the citations maybe they glossed over some stuff and summarized things without you know, yeah. I, I don't know, but it, it, it seemed like if they had gone a lot deeper, I don't know anyone would have read the book except for a very small handful of people who want to study this stuff. So, yeah, um, well, and I, I think it was just my expectations going into it that, um, so I first heard James Lindsay like a year ago on the Babylon Bee podcast. And so it, it was in the era of when his book at the time was uh, how to have impossible conversations. 
And so I, I expected with this book, you know, it, more of the same of just like, here's how to counter the, you know, critical theory, social justice, whatever narrative. And what I was surprised by with this book, just as a general comment, and then I'll get to something more specific, is that it, it was really like a deep dive into the scholarship, into the, you know, um, academic sort of background of a lot of this. And yeah, I'll, I'll defer to Sam for the the more nuts and bolts of that. I'm, I, I was an engineering major, so this is like totally outside of my league. But um, what, what I really appreciated from this book was um, seeing at times how the, the proponents of social justice really see themselves as the heroes. And, you know, uh, it's, we're, we're, we're sort of locked in this big cultural battle. Like, you know, even a year ago, James Lindsay was saying, this is like going to be cultural war 2.0, you know, cultural, cultural war 1.0 was atheists versus Christians. And, and that, that's what I've loved about unsafe space is that there's such a variety of people here and of backgrounds. And, but we're, we're sort of, we're realizing we have a lot more in common than, than maybe we would have thought. But, uh, and I don't have a page number because this is in Kindle, but um, this is in the chapter where he talks about critical education theory. And he says that um, it holds that it's dangerous to allow students to express such disagreement. This is because of its reliance on the postmodern knowledge principle, social reality, and what is accepted as true and constructed by language. Disagreement would allow dominant discourses to be reasserted, voiced, and heard, which, which theory sees is not safe. Um, you know, the, the whole topic of censorship has been a very hot topic lately. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've been thinking about that specifically related to this. So it, it helps at times to, you know, going back way back to Jordan's question of like, how do we approach people that are coming from this vantage point? Um, I think it just, it really helped me to see that these proponents think they're saving people or rescuing people from harm or they're, they're protecting certain groups of people from being dominated or being um, kind of silenced or, or whatever, or erased. And it, I think it all goes back. And again, I'm, I'm going to defer to people that know more, but the, the way I understood it, it goes back to this idea of the postmodern knowledge principle that social reality is constructed by language. And so I, I think other people would say reality is discovered by language or it's described by language, but this idea that, you actually construct reality by what you say. Well, then, well, then, of course, you would want to silence things that sort of unravel that reality or, or make it violent or unsafe for others. Um, and and again, th this is like such a different mindset, but it helped me to understand that that's where a lot of this is coming from. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's helpful. Um, I just want to, I want to pause and make a comment about, um, I, <laughs> there's, a, there's arguments about what, how, how academic this book is. Uh, I, I do think it, ultimately this is written for a mass market, right? This is not intended to be, uh, a textbook. Um, it's not intended to be, it's, this is written for the average person, but I'm going to, I'm going to, this is just a, this is my personal problem with a lot of academia, um, and so I just want to reveal my bias about it a little bit, I guess. Uh, I think it's I think it's academia's job to be able to communicate clearly their ideas to average people. And if they cannot, then standing behind this, I like, well, you don't understand the nuance of blah, blah, blah. And it's actually much more complicated. And blah, 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 blah. like I, to me, that is just an obfuscation game. And it lets them get away with a lot of evil and a lot of stupidity under the guise of, I mean, go ahead and try and read Judith Butler, who's the classic example of like incomprehensible, right? You can hide behind academic language and prestige and, and you can condescendingly look down on average people and say, you don't understand these, these highfalutin ideas. But at the end of the day, if these highfalutin ideas uh, if the best that academia can do is distill these high flutin ideas to thoughts that are like all white people are racist, then we don't need to understand the complexity behind get yourself a better way. Like if you guys are the experts in academia and that's not a great distillation, then police yourselves. Tell Robin DiAngelo she's bullshit. Get on, get on national television and talk to people in simple terms about what these ideas actually mean, because otherwise we're going to assume that the people that you're putting forth 
that are being representative, like Ibram Kendi and Robin D'Angelo, are accurately transmitting these ideas to average people. And that's actually what they mean. So I think it's a uh, it's a really dishonest technique to stand back behind the guise of of scholarship and say, well, you just don't understand this and that and the other thing. And they didn't do a great job of citing this and that and the other thing. OK, fine. Do it yourself. And, and who you should be fighting is not the people criticizing it, but the people that you think are responsible for making it look like trash to the outside world. If it's not trash, then correct it and make it look like not trash to the outside world. Don't just pick on people who look at this and say it's trash and say, well, you don't understand the nuance. It's not actually trash. It's just, it's just that Robin D'Angelo makes it look like trash. Well, pick on her then. It's Sorry, like, the, just, it's it, like when you told me, me about the Catholic church and how they said, um, you can't read the Bible. You, you have to rely on us to interpret it for you. Exactly. It's, it's a religion. It's like priesthood. It's someone in chat says it's like, it's, uh, it's like the, the priest speaking Latin. Well, you can, you don't understand the Bible because you don't speak Latin. Well then translate the fucking thing into English for us. Will you? That's your job. Right. Um, all right. <laughs> sorry. Victor, sorry. You have to follow like, that, but uh... Victor, you're next on my list. <laughs> so go. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think uh, I should pass for someone else who hasn't talked uh, yet. Uh, this Carol uh, Deb, I guess. Sure. Uh, Carol can be next on the queue. We can just put yourself back in, Victor, and we'll, we'll do Carol next. Hi. I want to approach this from a really pragmatic um, point of view. Um, I heard about the book from a friend of mine who was reading it, and she heard him on a pod, James on a podcast. And I was just, I listened to him. He was presenting himself as a, a liberal libertarian. He was talking with a conservative and they were just pleading with people to realize how dangerous that um, the, this is, this wokeism. And um, I just was impressed with um, just how he was being very pragmatic about it's harmful. And I am not a philosopher. Um, and I know that things do start in the universities, but right now I do know, I do recognize authoritarianism and Marxism when I see it. And right now it's just happening right in front of us, not in the university, it's happening in my church. And um, I, I'm going to a very conservative church and they've adopted with pursuing racial reconciliation programs that borrow from from uh, critical racial theory, and it's just um, it's it's very disturbing to have to see it happen just right in front of you. And um, one of my favorite thinkers is Eric Metaxas. And to borrow the tiger illustration, we're going to have some lamenting ceremonies in in our church, and I'm I'm really disappointed in that. And he said, pastors, if you're doing this in your church, um, you think you're helping people. But he said, you're riding a tiger that will eat you. And I appreciated Carrie and Marie's thoughts. I think what Marie said today ties in with Carrie said something this week about looking for people who aren't too far gone to talk to, because I think that's the key. And I, I love what you said, Carter. I think sometimes calling things stupid uh, might work. I mean, there's a lot of these ideas that I think can be dismissed out of hand uh, because they're so ridiculously silly on face value that it's like, you know, if you actually implemented them in the real world, it's obvious to everyone that they utterly fail to produce anything. So, uh, but you know, you, you get intimidated. The the a lot of a lot of people make it their career to try and intimidate you intellectually and. Uh, you know, you just have to be self-confident enough that like you, you don't have to be uh, <laughs> you don't have to be Stephen Hawking to see that uh, a philosophy that, for example, puts people into categories and defines them based on their race is inherently going to be destructive to <laughs> unity and the progress of society. Uh, OK, let's do uh, Deb Bronca next. I think you're next on my queue, Deb. I just wanted to uh, first follow on uh, what you said, uh, Carter, about academicians writing things that people can't understand. I um, 
went to graduate school in history about 10 years ago, and all my professors were telling me to write, not use big words, and write things as simple, you know, simple so people understand them. And I gave a paper um, on Martin Luther, and uh, a woman came up to me who wasn't an academician afterwards, and she said of the three papers that were given, she could understand mine. So... <laughs> Um, there's no reason to, to have to write things so people can't understand it. And I, I thought it was really funny in the book. You know, they, they did a quote of one woman. I don't remember if it was Butler or one or the other. And um, Lindsay and Pluckrose actually interpreted it. And I'm like, how could they possibly actually interpret that? And this was the thing that was good about the book that um, it helped me understand the use of language in this movement. Because I was like, language is violence. How could language possibly be violence? And then when I realized that the understanding is that whatever language you use pushes a certain power narrative and you can't help that if you're white or male or whatever, that anything you say is going to be violence and they're going to deliberately interpret it in the worst possible way so it will be violence and you know what i mentioned before about um not being able to interpret what they said they use language in two ways that you you um it's uh incomprehensible and then you can't use it at all you can't say anything i I was reminded, I don't know how many people saw the video of Brett Weinstein being confronted by um, the mob at Evergreen. This was the first confrontation and all the kids in the mob, um, they're pulling out index cards and repeating mantras that are on the index cards, but Brett wanted to engage them and they wouldn't let him. And now I understand why, because Anything that Brett said, first of all, it's logical, which is Western, so you can't do that. And second of all, he's oppressing them with his power of his language or whatever he's doing. So I, I just think it's um, so interesting, their view of language. And this book really helped me understand that. And the second point I wanted to make about the book is their bias really comes out in a few places. And I went back and looked to see when they published it and it came out this year, but listen to this quote. This is from, uh, what page is it? Shoot. My Kindle doesn't always tell me the pages, but, um, it says, this shift away from class and towards gender identity, race, and sexuality troubles traditional economic leftists who fear that the left is being taken away from the working class and hijacked by the bourgeoisie within the academy. More worrying still, it could drive working class voters into the arms of the populist right. I think that happened in 2016. It, it was already happening. And here they're writing a book in 2020 and they're not realizing it. Yeah. I, yeah. Just, I just thought they're a little, um, little out of the loop. And also they said in another place that um, far right populists are turning to um, dictate, uh, dictators and straw men to save the Western values. And um my husband and I were trying to think of who they could mean besides Trump. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that I think uh, for anyone who follows them online, uh, they've been pretty open about their disagreement over this last U.S. election. And, um, you know, Helen's very open about the fact that she thought liberals, classical liberals should vote for Biden and made some arguments for Biden. And James uh, did the opposite, although he wasn't. Really? Okay. supporting he, he you know he, he wasn't like on a MAGA train with a hat but he was he was saying <laughs> I'm gonna vote for Trump and and I think and here's why so they do disagree on that and I do think it's a little bit like um 
two books ago when we read The Management of Savagery by Max Blumenthal. I really appreciate reading books from uh, liberals and, and also progressives and stuff in book club as well, because sometimes, if, especially if you want to give this book to someone and they have an intense hatred of someone like Trump, for example, it helps to, I'm not saying that the book needs to be, and I'm glad it wasn't littered with a lot of references to Trump or any, you know, but oh, right. um, it's easier for them to hear it from someone who shares maybe um, shares that, that uh, uh, skepticism about, or that disapproval of uh, a right-wing populist like Trump. So uh, I also want to say, I know we still have a lot of people, but um, just to Carol's point, quickly who said carol your last point about it was okay to say an idea is stupid i like that they brought that up in here i felt like anyway that was a big part of it which is that we have to have that courage to say that we don't agree with all we don't have to believe like i said before, we don't have to believe and i don't have to agree with your idea and not all ideas are equally valid like i, I will listen to your idea but it doesn't mean i have to give it the same respect as this other idea that has better argument and better evidence All right, journal poems. I think you are next on my list here. All right, thank you. Uh, so this kind of has to do with uh, what Carter was saying about um, the complexity stuff, I guess. Uh, me personally, I kind of like to look for simplicity on the other side of complexity. Um, and, and what does this all really mean? Like when it when it comes to um, when it comes down to it, you know. And I've, I've I've felt it coming for a long time. I think a lot of people have, and I really appreciated how. Uh, Helen and James kind of connected all the dots and kind of showed us like where it came from. Um, but I think it's important to also look at like, you know, what does it mean? And, and I think it has to do with kind of why they chose to, to title the book Cynical Theories is because these theories are inherently cynical and which is fine. You can have a cynical theory, but when you look at what it's done to society in making everyone more cynical, toward each other. And, you know, they, they talked about how, you know, critical race theory just by its nature insists that you look for, um, you're cynical about your relationships with people, you're cynical about society. And just when you're having a conversation with somebody, you're, you're thinking, you know, is that a microaggression? Like, how is this person actually racist? And the other person's thinking, you know, is this person, um, Anyway, it just, it infiltrates every like conversation, um, every relationship. And it just made me think about like, instead of like looking for racism in every conversation, what if we looked for like grace or what if we looked, instead of like trying to find what's wrong with someone or what's wrong with, um, okay, so instead of, Sorry, um, just look for like something good in them instead of trying to find what the bad thing is about uh, their ideology or, or your conversation that you're having um, or your relationship. And, um, you know, it doesn't mean that we can't talk about what problems there are, uh, but I think just the very nature of treating everything so cynically is not a good way to, to go about having relationships and having society. And I think, um, it's important to, to recognize that, even though you may not understand everything about every single philosopher that came before, like look at what look at what it's doing to to society, and uh, realizing that there, there's a better way. Yeah, so. I think that's a I think that's a good point. I mean, ultimately, the purpose of all academia sh and especially philosophy should be uh, to help humans live on Earth, and so if the manifestation of it no matter how complex they believe it is, if the manifestation is something that's destructive, uh, I think I think that's enough to counter it, right? You don't you don't really have to waste your time uh, reading all of the origins to see. Oh, the result of this is a destructive destructive behavior. Um, Kyle, I think you're next. Kyle W. And I immediately fail to use the interface. Um, but one um, one thing that I think is we've sort of been having this side conversation in the text chat. But one thing that I think is good to think about is like 
I think of critical theory kind of like lead paint, you know, and a lot of the different ways it manifests are kind of like toys or walls or, you know, like there's things that appear to have some enjoyable or practical utility. Um, like my background is in education. And when I got my degree in education, we had a lot of the sort of like postmodern educational theory, but we didn't get the theoretical background. We got like, um, I remember the thing that sort of red, yeah, lead paint. Um, the thing that sort of red pilled me about social justice was when I was doing my student teaching, I had been placed at the place where I went to high school to do my student teaching. And I was looking over the roster to see if there were any like names I recognized. Um, and it was, um, while I was doing that, that I was talking about, yeah, I think I'll get along pretty well with a lot of the students. I hadn't explained my full background to my mentor teacher. She wasn't really interested in talking to me. And I sort of figured out why shortly after that. And she said, well, you won't understand it them very well because you're a white straight man. Um, and and immediately that like it that's was like not, it, that's not condescending at all is it <laughs> yeah no it was literally like it was literally like that matrix moment where it's like all this stuff about like i mean like we'd heard like students do better with teachers who are of, of similar identity groups to they are or to them you know, and you don't need any postmodern theory background for it. You know, it's sort of something that if you come from just like a generic liberalism background, they think, yeah, you know, it's like if I were a kid and I were going through school and all the teachers didn't look like me, I could see how that would be a thing. But then when you take the inverse of that and you say it, it's just like, oh, crap. You know, it's like the the implication of turning that into your driving agenda, you know, like you can play with the toy with lead paint for a certain amount of time but once you get enough exposure and it builds up that's when it gets toxic and that's one of like I was very sort of disappointed when I read chapter 10 um, not because I necessarily disagree with a lot of what they say but because they're like bring up the things that you agree on and it's like yes you should you should be able to point out we have shared values we want the same end goal which is we want everyone to be free we want everyone to be happy we want everyone to be successful to the degree that they are able to but if you do it the way that you're doing it you will cause harm rather than benefit yeah Cool. Thank you. I think uh, I think Philip Moss is back up next and then Manny is according to my Q here. So, Philip. And can we actually just, is, is there someone who hasn't spoken yet uh, who wants to speak? Well, Put it doesn't hand? look like Philip yeah, is speaking, I can, I can and wait, I know Manny Philip hasn't. Um, I, anyway, Philip. okay. I'll go ahead and say um, that. A couple of the things uh, Helen, uh, well, it's Helen's voice on the Audible app, so I'm thinking of it as Helen, whatever they said in the book, um, which for somebody who's a little more like right of center, uh, you know, just stood out to me and I just thought they deserve to be pointed out. Um, she basically says in the uh, first chapter uh, something about, or maybe the introduction, like we, um, we agree with the goal of social justice. Um, but you know that's lowercase s, lowercase j kind of thing, and I'm like, well, it's almost like a verbal tick that people have when right before they start to, uh, I don't know, describe their their disagreement. You know, people who are trying to like undo the SJW worldview, they're like, no, I agree with like social justice, and I just want to say you don't have to say that, and uh, I don't happen to like agree with social justice. In fact. I would just point out any attempt to be like, oh my gosh, the, uh, the let's just say the wealthy are so wealthy and the poor are so poor. That's not in the conservative view, a matter of justice at all. 
it's a matter of social danger. Society will not cohere if we have such extremes of inequality. And for that reason, we must interfere. Not because it's just or, or anything else. You have to make society cohere. So it's these deep problems of statecraft. Like how do we make society not fall apart? How do we keep uh, a public thing that we can, uh, we're all sort of like getting people to buy in to the program, meaning to society, to its institutions is important, not because of justice, but because that's otherwise we're screwed. So a conservative doesn't see it in terms of justice. And these are all schemes of benevolence, properly speaking, not justice, if you want to ameliorate the condition of this or that or whatever. Um, and in the race chapter, following on that same point, she says, uh, we agree that we should address imbalances. And I didn't disagree, but I just wondered, like, again, if it's a matter of like, uh, sort of the existential consideration of like, imbalances will tear us apart, fine. I, I also think that is the way you think about these things. But if you say, I'm committed to making sure there aren't imbalances between this or that, a salient racial group or whatever, because we could always divide up the groups differently, but we happen to divide them up this way in our society from our point of view and say, oh my gosh, well, look at the, uh, the asset differences between this and that group. Um, once you commit to addressing imbalances on principle, you're already like, yeah, I'm willing to put my finger on the scale here, double standards for everything. And that for me is like, that's where we're screwed. So the race chapter was about all of these like double standards. And you're just like, this is maddening. There's no place for like dialogue between equals if, if double standards are going to take uh, hold to this extent. Um, and so that idea of like, let's address imbalances. It's like, well, let's address them if they're too great, but let's not commit to saying no identifiable groups of any sort should have imbalances because that's the norm that's to be expected. Hmm. That's all I had to say. All right, Manny, uh, I think you're up next, Manny. Hi, everybody. Great seeing you. Hi, Manny. Uh, hi, hi. Um, yeah, great discussion. Uh, I like the book a lot, too. Uh, I've, been, I've been learning a lot about the whole subject just from watching you guys at Unsafe Space. And uh, my, my thought, I always try to break down things and try to understand in a more simplistic way, uh, or at least in simpler terms. And like some of the other people who've already spoken have said, um, I do not believe most people actually believe the actual core of how the um, social justice theories work, right? I don't think the majority, I think most people are a good natured. Now I'm not saying that the other ones are not, but most people are coming from a good spot because they want things to be better for others that maybe haven't had, you know, they're, they're, they're the life they've lived or maybe the, the way life was before, the way the world was before they were, you know, there was, there was discrimination. There has been, I mean, there, that's all things that are true, but what's happened is we've had this theory that's taken over a very uh, emotionally charged subject. And it's been used by a, a it's been used in a way to sort of force everybody to have to accept a certain thought way of thought, or you basically are not, you know, you, you're, you're shot down, you're accused of being a racist or a Nazi or whatever it is. And uh, the, the problem is not the thought because it's not because of the thought where it comes from, but it's the intolerance that comes with it. Because if we didn't have that, then we wouldn't have a problem because we could all talk, right. And share ideas. And that's how, the whole thing is supposed to work. And like uh, Josh and Tom and, and Marie and some of the others have said, I think the key is how do we speak to each other in a way that we're not shutting our doors? I mean, if you think about arguing with somebody who has a different opinion than yours, the way you approach that argument is it, it leads to them being open-minded at least to, art, to at least listen to you and you have to listen to them too, right? Many times, Unfortunately, in the world we live in, and I think it's compounded by technology, Twitter, for example, or, or not just Twitter, I'm just saying it as an example. Twitter. People treat each other with complete disrespect. Everybody is the worst. They always think that somebody's coming from a bad place or their, their intentions are, you know, are, are bad. Nobody gives anybody benefit of the doubt. 
because of where in that culture we're living in this world, maybe technology actually exasperates it, is what's leading to this. And so what the challenge we have is trying to open a conversation. And I know it's hard. I've never had to do it. I know some of you have. And I, I how what's the key to open that door to sort of get a conversation with some people that may be more open-minded that might see well, this is an intolerance say, of view. Nobody likes intolerance. Nobody likes to be bigoted. Unfortunately, the, the view where you say, yeah, it's this way or this is the only way. And if you think different, you're canceled. That's a bigoted thought, right? So how do we approach that discussion with people and try to make a world better? Uh, you know, it, Carrie's a great example. I, she's very self-aware, I think. And because of that, you were able to come from one side to the other. Right. I think that we are able to reach people and maybe come to a better understanding if we are talking individually. I think like Marie was saying, when we're talking to a mob or there's we're being attacked or something like that, unfortunately, it doesn't work. So the challenge, because the way I read the book, I was trying to find ways that we can make things better. Right. Because we have to. I mean, we're in a really bad place, I think, with this canceled culture, the whole environment we're in. It's, it's a big problem. And hopefully we can make it better. It's, it's, it's incumbent to all of us to do a little bit and, and to stand for, our, I mean, we also have to be brave, I guess. Like many of you have said, it's not easy sometimes, but you have to be brave, stand up for your values. And when you think something is not right, well, we have to say it. We cannot just be pushovers. And like, I think a lot of companies, corporate America, they just care about business and dollars. So if they have a big mob coming after them saying, hey, and this is bad, you know, blah, 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 we should cancel these people. They do it because they're just they're just bowing down to the people who is the loudest. And until there's a counter to that, we're not going to come out of this. So that's sort of a little bit of <laughs> standing on my soapbox and saying uh, some thoughts that I had. Yeah, well put, love- Annie. Thank you. Um, yes. And I would just... Um- you made me think of what Marie was saying earlier is it's just a matter of figuring out which people are worth having the conversations with and which ones are not. And sometimes that's a tricky way, a tricky thing to try and figure out, but uh, you know, not everyone's worth having the conversation with, but a lot of people are more people are, I think. Yep. Uh, Cheeky mayor. I don't think cheeky mayor has spoken yet. Cheeky mayor. Uh, I think you're in the queue. Want to jump in? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, So I'm a little indifferent to the arts, having the do what you'd want, do you do you stuff. Like I'm a quilter and a cross stitcher. And as long as you know the basics of how to make a stitch or how to put two pieces of fabric together, I don't really care if you want to do modern art or, you know, traditional or whatever. Um, the one thing that does scare me quite a bit about the social justice is, um, about the, it's on page 219 and it, it may be a little bit ego driven cause it's from my alma mater, but, um, the engineering and social justice published by Purdue university, we read many variations on the same theme, getting beyond views of truth as objective and absolute is the most fundamental change we need in engineering education. Are you kidding me? Like, I don't want to drive over a bridge where two plus two equals five in their calculations. I don't want to drive in a and ride in a in a self-propelling car if two plus two equals five. Like <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, like they're going off the cliff. <laughs> and that's scary. And I mean, it might be that something we need. Like, how did you calculate this? And five thousand people died. Oh, well, two plus two equals five. Oh, well, let's change that. Let's go back to two plus two equals four because that's the correct and absolute and objective truth. I don't know. So that was my biggest um, the scary part, in my opinion. Um, and to go back to what Carter was saying, I think um, the uh, the right, the left-leaning social justice warrior people with who are academics are basically 13 year old 
13 year olds, because I have one in my um, Bible study class that I teach on Sunday. And um, she uses these big words and I, that wrongly. And then it's like, I don't understand what you're saying. And she says to me, well, oh, I forgot. Millennials don't get Gen Z humor. And I just want to go, but you know, whatever. That's just me. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, A personal pet peeve of mine is newbie SJWs who use a lot of big words incorrectly. And when you, and they just assume you're uh, uh, a normie or maybe you, you haven't heard these things before. And when you object, they immediately insult your intelligence and say, well, you're just not smart enough to understand yeah. what white privilege means. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they like, she just assumes that I'm left leaning too. And I'm like, dude, I've got a gun in my purse. Like, let's go away. <laughs> Not that I would hurt anybody. I'm a carrier. That's what it was for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we get it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, on the one hand, I, I think it's fine if you want to have an engineering class where you base it on craziness that two plus two is five, that's all fine. If you want to have philosophy, that's crazy and incomprehensible that no one can criticize if they haven't spent 10 years reading the nuance and understanding, like that's all fine. Uh, but you should expect to be, and you should rightly be dismissed out of hand by a larger society. We should say, okay, that that's fine. But that engineering degree means nothing to us. We're not going to hire you to build a bridge because, you know, you can have that, uh, you know, Hey, your postmodern theory is fine. You guys can go talk about it all you want, but, but expect to be dismissed out of hand. If you, if the application of it is crazy, expect us just to dismiss you out of hand. Um, so you, you're not obligated to, to make it actionable. But if you can't make it actionable, if you can't make it something that actually helps people in the real world, then we can ignore you. And we should, because the rest of us have lives to lead and are trying to make the world a better place. So uh, I view this as a, it's a defense mechanism that they use where they, they, uh, they get you to, they're like, well, you can't possibly argue with my philosophy until you've spent all this time reading all this crap. And then maybe you can understand. And then I'll still argue that you don't get the nuance. It's like, well, that just stifles the discussion. If your philosophy is so bad that the implementation of it makes a bridge fall down, then I don't have to, I can just dismiss it out of hand and say, you know what? Go away. I don't, I don't want to read it. I don't want to understand it. I don't have to. It clearly doesn't work in reality. Um, and if you say, well, that's just a misapplication, well, find someone who will apply it properly and maybe we won't dismiss them out of hand if it works. But uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, Cheeky. All right. Uh, I think Sagita um, is next, although I, th- I feel like I'm pronouncing that wrong. I always forget how to pronounce it, but I'm going to say Sagita. That is could be wrong. That is good. Um, it's been so fun listening to everyone. And I think a lot of the comments that I had earlier have already been said. Um, and it's, it's good to have different opinions here as well. Like, you know, Sam's take on everything. Um, I, I'm looking at postmodernism and I'm thinking it's kind of like a playground sort of you know, ideal phase where, you know, all of us who are younger or most of us or some of us at least, we had that, you know, that time in our lives where, you know, what is reality? Is it real? Like, can there be a way to get to it? Sort of playful, you know, you can poke sticks at major narratives and and all of that. It's, and then real life happens and you're like, uh, let's leave that for, you know, playground younger days. It's not all that important. I actually think um, Helen and James maybe, would have done better if they hadn't even tied it to postmodernism. Let's just look at these theories. They are cynical. Uh, they are atrocious ideas who has, have seeped into our lives and um, their intentions are authoritarian, totalitarian, evil, destructive. They look at anything only from the negative point of view. And it's, it's really hard, you know, like, all of us who, who live real lives um, don't, you know, we see, we try to see positives because that like, makes life livable and worth living. And it's, it's just so destructive. And, and I wonder how it doesn't fall flat on its face, just hit reality now or yesterday even. 
how do these things just perpetuate themselves without actually hitting that reality? Um, I, if, I really found it helpful to, um, Helen and James mentioned Jonathan Rausch and, and Kindly Inquisitors. I find that book extremely helpful in understanding why free speech is really important and what really liberalism has, you know, given us over time historically and um, why it's worth defending like actual real liberal values, um, not the chimeras, not the dressed up social justice kind of things. Um, so I would, if anybody's interested that, that I, I just started reading it and, and, and it's really less academic and more grounded to me. Um, so that, that's it. Thank you. No, thank you, Sigita. Thank and, you and, very much. Uh, I, thanks for bringing up that book because I haven't read it, but I noticed they referenced it in, in this book and it makes me want to check it out. Before we go to the next person, I just want to, <laughs> Tatiana said something in chat with the super chat, um, which I, I kind of want to just underscore because it, it's important. We've said variants of this before, uh, you know, but she says they can start a commune and run everything postmodernly, no help from anyone. So then they can see how it works out. Uh, and if you want to understand what a lot of these ideologies are about, uh, that's actually, I think, a good tool to just see. If you want to see that they're about power and control, all you have to do is offer, offer to separate and say, look, am I allowed to have a group where we don't do this and we operate uh, with liberal values and you have your postmodern society over there or your, I won't even say postmodern, your, you know, social justice utopia over on this side of the world and we'll have our spot over here. Is that okay? Um, because the answer in a liberal society is yes, you are allowed to go do that. We, you're totally allowed to go have your commune or what you can do whatever you want. You're totally allowed to go set up a society built based on whatever you want inside, uh, a, a free, uh, liberty based, um, society. But if you want liberty inside of the, a cynical theory or social justice based society, you're not allowed to. And that should tell you all you need to know. They need to control you. You're not asking to control them. They're asking to control you. In fact, they're demanding to control you. And, you know, that says to me, that says just about as much as you need to know. Um, all right, next, Alex. I think, Alex, you're, you're up next if you want to hop in. Okay. Um, so, uh, I keep saying this uh, because people keep going like, oh, it's so academic. These are just people writing papers. And I've read some of these papers. Um, and I, w I went to, um, I don't, I went to grad school. So I also like, and the problem is, is that a lot of their papers are essays. They're more essays than they are actual studies, but they, per they masquerade as studies. Um, so they have this veneer of being uh, real science and they're not because I've read science studies too and they're completely different. And uh, the thing is, is that a lot of people are like, well, how is this just stay, how, how is this not staying in the universities? And it's like, you have to remember the US pretty much demanded uh, that everybody get a degree to go out into the world and succeed. So the, and everyone at universities, which I taught at a university for a couple of years has to take a section of courses and they're now demanding that they take specifically critical social justice courses. Uh, so everyone's taking these classes, no matter what their degree is in. And then they go out into the world and they, they go into tech, they go into uh, public education, they go into entertainment media, they go into everything. And so, for example, you might think that there's no way that this could hit our kids yet. Um, and I, I, I'm using the general hour, um, but then I know 18 year olds who just graduated from high school who are spouting this crap because their teachers came out of a university that spouted this crap to them. And they don't necessarily know that they are doing this theory that they're spreading it like the virus that it is um, on a conscious level, but, they're, but they are doing it. And then people think, well, this is the way of the world. This is the truth. So that's why this, you can't 
act as if this isn't as serious as it is because it is everywhere. And I feel like the book doesn't really give us the tools we need to combat it in the end. I feel like it gives us a lot of information about how it came out um, and how it's formed and why it, it makes the pseudo sense it does when you talk to these people. But I don't think it really helps us practically to address any of it. And that's my biggest complaint about the book is that I'm like, okay, thank you for the information. What do I do? And I feel like that's where we need more information. And there is, you can read things on how to talk to people. And I know a lot of, uh, I've read a lot of communication books, especially for communicating with people with distorted thinking. But I just, I feel like it's a it's bigger than even just a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone because of the fact that they control the entertainment, they co control journalism, they control corporations, they're in our politics, they're, they're public education, that's the worst one, they're in our public education. And what do we do? Yep. yep. I, think, All I right. think you're, I think you're right. Uh, I think that the next book after this, I think that the next conversations that people will have after this are going to be hopefully a little more focused on what do we do. I know they gave at the end, you know, they, it was very brief, but they gave the um, the list of uh, statements, things that we we both deny and things that we contend as examples, and said, you know, we can create our own lists. Um, but but one of the things that I I took away from it that I thought was most clear was that, I mean, I. I again, they're writing to the layperson, and presumably they're writing both to people who already know that social justice, capital S, capital J is a problem and want to know how to help others. And then, and then they're also writing to those others <laughs> that the first group is giving the book to. And so um, it's, it's because it's focused on both of those groups. I think they, it, the book itself is a little more focused on how did we get here? What is the problem? Let's lay it out. And then, the, and then the part about what we can do was just very brief at the end, you know, but uh, I'm rambling now. Let's move. We still have people who haven't spoken yet. We do. So, we do. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think Peter Grant, Peter, I don't think you've had a chance to speak yet. You want to hop in? Well, I have, but I'll, I'll hop in. You have, there you are. I, I forgot, but, you. but now thank I recognize you. you. I see you there. <laughs> thank you, Carter. And thank you, Carrie, for doing this. This is very, very helpful. Uh, this has been about a five-year journey for me, but the last six months has been incredibly encouraging because I think there's been a, a, a surge of people, like many of the participants today, that I've been encouraged by because so many folks are wrestling with the same issue. And I, and I, I would encourage us to speak up bravely and boldly, not rudely or forcefully, but bravely and boldly, uh, especially, in, again, I'm a pastor, so I'm going to encourage those of you who hear this from your pastor, your church leaders, just speak up bravely and boldly. I would recommend a couple of sources. I think uh, Neil Shenvey, S-H-E-N-V-I, is a Trump. That name's so unique, you'll find it on the internet, but he's got a fantastic website that addresses these issues from a Christian perspective with very clear how-tos and so on and so forth. I think, uh, actually, some folks might not know this, but James Lindsay has, uh, uh, what's it, is it New, New Discourses? New Discourses website, again, very, very helpful. And I think there'll be more and more, so I'm looking forward to it, but thank you so much for this. I would ask a question, make an observation, ask a question. One of the things that's bothered me about this discussion with uh, folks either who are coming from a religious perspective with this new theology, this meta-narrative, which I think is what it is, this dominant meta-narrative, either coming from a religious perspective or a liberal perspective, um, is the almost total lack of their ability to nuance discussions. So whether it's a discussion about social justice or uh, criminal justice or history or religion or whatever it might be, there seems to be an almost palpable inability to nuance a discussion. Um, I mean, I could give examples, but I think you know what I'm talking about. I'd be interested to hear from folks like Kerry who have lived the social justice experience uh, for many years. Is, is that a valid observation and what what do you think that comes from? Because that's, to me, that's very dangerous in any field. If you can't nuance discussions, you're not a mature person. And yet it seems that, that the people I deal with cannot nuance these discussions. 
if that makes uh, thank sense. Thank you. Yeah, it I'll, I'll speak to that. And then maybe there's other people. I don't know. We have such a big group today. Maybe there's other people who were believers in social justice who want to speak. But um, I think this gets to the cult-like aspect of it. And in my experience, there, I've been watching a lot of cult documentaries lately because it's helping me to understand this part of it. There is a, a deep fear that a lot of people have, especially the further they get into the social justice ide ideology. There's a great fear that they have of being seen as ideologically impure and being attacked and being shamed. And because it is moral, because it, it yeah. you know, this gets to the moral part that they talk about in the book. It's like a religion and except there's no concept of grace. And, and when, when they, if, when they turn on you and they will, like when you're in it, you watch, I watched infighting all of the time. No one was safe from it. And, and it's actually, especially the more um, credit that you build up within the belief system, like, like there were several feminist blogs I used to follow very regularly. And I knew some of the uh, founders of some of these blogs, but they would be regularly attacked because the more you set yourself apart, um, you're being seen as succeeding. Well, then within the ideology, well, then they're going to look at, well, why are you succeeding? Because the whole belief system is built on this sort of resentment and this idea that everything that, that anyone gets that someone else doesn't get has to be because of privilege and discrimination. So they would regularly tear one another down. Um, so because of that, they, yeah, there's just this fear of, of thinking and of having nuanced conversations and um, people have to really get past that fear and they have to be, I think we have to offer people, show people that it is possible to have a social life outside of social justice ideology and to have friends and to have liberal friends. This is one of the reasons why I really love that this book came from a classical liberal like Helen Pluckrose because um, a, conservatives, a lot of conservatives, are, not all, but a lot of conservatives are already speaking against social justice ideology. And because of this crazy polarized time we're living in where the media is telling us that the biggest difference between us is whether we're on the right or left, which is not true. Yep. Um, then a lot of people on the left are afraid of agreeing with anything that's considered to be that that's on the right. So if there's criticism coming from the right towards social justice ideology, then we have to show liberals that you liberal, you, you, you can, and you should push back against this belief system because it is a liberal, it is a liberal. It is, it is opposed to your beliefs and we have to create room for liberals to see that you can still be a liberal. They're not liberals, in fact. <laughs> They're not. You are. And 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 create that space and, and that room for people to, I don't know, see that there's a life after being excommunicated by their social circles, by their tribe, you know, all the all the things that people fear. Um, and they fear, and 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 I know I'm going on way too long now, but just they don't just fear, like you pointed out, they don't just fear disagreeing with social justice ideology they fear even having conversations like you pointed out they fear the conversations because they might fall into a trap <laughs> they might accidentally say the wrong thing or they might be um uh i think there's an underlying fear there that, that a lot of times at least there was for me that i knew i even if i wasn't like cognizant of it deep down i knew that i wasn't comfortable engaging in arguments about some of these things because I hadn't done a lot of the reading and thinking necessary. They're speaking other people's opinions. They're not speaking their own opinions. They haven't done the work. It's funny because they always say do the work, but they haven't done the work. Um, okay, I'll, I'll let someone else talk. May, is, are there any other social former social justice people here? Simone, are you former social justice? Do you want to well, speak? Well, Simone's kind of next on my list. So Simone, why don't you speak anyway, regardless of sure. whether you're a former social justice? <laughs> well, actually I'm a social worker. So um, I was definitely educated uh, undergrad and graduate steeped in social justice theory. And um, it, it, it over the course of a number of years, it's actually engendered a lot of moral distress for me. And that's kind of why I kind of got deprogrammed myself, so to speak. It was that. Uh, 
seeing um, the disconnection, I think I came up against um, what someone else was talking about earlier, reality, and um, how these theories are actually quite um, destructive. And uh, Carrie, you know, you mentioned something. It's when, when, you, when you have a discussion with somebody who is still really in the mindset of social justice, uh, it really is almost like a, an idea. It is. It's an ideological possession. And there's a quote at the end of uh, cynical series there in the conclusion and the statement that it, it says, um, referencing, you don't have to really be a, a great expert on the great liberal thinkers, nor do you need to, page 266, become well-versed in theory and social justice scholarship so that you can confidently refute it. But you do need to have a little bit of courage to stand up to something with a lot of power. You need to recognize theory when you see it and side with the liberal response to it which might not be any more complicated than saying, no, that's your ideological belief and I don't have to go along with it. Good. Good. And I think that was one of the big things for me is starting to separate the difference between what really I was taught in school as fact to a belief. And I, I also wanted to comment on one other little thing at the beginning, um, I think it was, it was Sam <laughs> that was talking about how we just really don't understand enough um, postmodernism and that throughout the book that they just don't adequately describe and source up what the scholars are saying. Now, whether or not people don't understand exactly what Foucault was saying, I think that was the whole point of Foucault <laughs> was for us not to understand it. But um, being in social work, um, these were the things that we talked about all of the time in school and whether or not we completely understood it, it is what's being taught in the school and then it is actually being operationalized out in society by professionals doing their practice. Yeah. So that's just a few little things that I wanted to say. And thanks again for uh, signing up to do this. I really appreciate it. That's awesome, Simone. I love, I love meeting former, we should have a former yeah. cult meeting. I agree, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Well, thank you, Simone. I think the next one on my list is Ben. Uh, so Ben, can you uh, unmute? Yeah, <laughs> I haven't eaten lunch, so I might be a little, little crazy. Um, Alex and I think Joel and I were kind of talking in the comments about how this reflects like borderline personality disorder. Um, I don't want to call social justice warriors. I'm not saying they have a mental disorder or anything, but I'm just wondering if Alex or Joel or, um, sorry, I just forgot who was last, but uh, was also a therapist. Like, how do we, um, how do you engage? Because at some point we're probably gonna have to engage someone. Um, and when you try to engage a borderline, you can't really engage. So I don't know if there's a way to engage with a social justice warrior and um, I don't know, have a productive, productive um, conversation, so. There is a way to do it. Um, for one thing, uh, you have to first have some intense resilience of what you know is real and what you know is objective and what you believe, who you are as a person, because they will try to tell you you're a terrible person. That is what borderline personality people do. They try to break you down, break down your agency, which, which is why I say it's like borderline personality disorder. So when you're talking, see, it's the sense that you're talking to borderline personality disorder people, the way that you do that when it's actually one of those people, technically they're almost always either a patient or a loved one. So the idea is that you're coming at it from a perspective of either I'm trying to help this person or I need to live with this person in some way, um, like every day. Um, but when you're doing it with necessarily a stranger, that's a completely different process. Um, one you can just easily walk away from. But say it is a family member that it, or, or a close friend or coll colleague that is doing this. A lot of it comes from the idea that you need to uh, validate emotional response because the whole point is that their emotions are going to go higher and higher and higher and their behavior is going to match that and so you cut them off by validating their emotions as quickly as possible but then you then you go into uh talking about reality uh like when they try to tell you who you are what you are you that's when you counter that it's like i understand how you could perceive that 
Um, but that's not true, and this is why. So those those are some like really basic techniques. But the first one is always to the uh, val validating emotions, which is a lot of people are are reticent to do that because it's a sense of agreement. But it's not actually agreement. You're agreeing that they're upset. Obviously, they're upset. They're screaming at you. Um, so and that's usually the only thing you're agreeing to. It, it's that's still objective reality. The fact that they're mad is true. Um, so don't feel like you, you're betraying anything by saying that. Um, so just to give you like a general idea, but that's like really basic. And yeah, the most important thing is that internal resiliency, knowing that what they say, who they are, and what they say about you is not actually a reflection of who you are. That's more important than anything else. Because that I way you can stay- one... Oh, sorry, sorry. Did I- I thought, I thought yeah, I was just going to say it's it, that's how you stay calm in that uh, is remembering that. Yeah, to one point, I, I think that's very good advice. I think the point about validating emotions is key. I also think one thing that I've found useful um, is always searching for uh, points of mutual agreement. So if you find anything that they say, that you can latch onto and be like, yeah, I think that was actually a really good point. Like any, just do that as frequently as you can and always start your rebuttals with those. It makes it a lot easier. Cool. Thanks, Sam and Alex. Uh, I love both of those, both of those yeah. suggestions. Joel, I think Joel's next. Joel, you going to hop in? Uh, all right. Well, Joel, we'll come back to you. How about Thomas St. Thomas? Hey, guys. Yeah, so there's um, a common theme that I keep hearing we, that we keep discussing that is the um, nature of whether or not people that have this ideology or even know they have this ideology but are acting out these things, well, uh, whether or not, and even if in the book they create a, a nice line between this is what the scholarship says and this is why this is happening. And, and I think that's something I would like to see more of. I really like to be able to, to, to do that because people often say, well, you know, I don't know that CRT, critical race theory, these theories are actually producing this, you know, they say totally different things. Um, and that, that's fair. And I think that's a good question to ask. Um, but I think that we also have a lot of other underlying um, philosophies and ideas that are already embedded in our culture that even someone like me who is like a metaphysical atheist has to also agree that most of the framework with which I view the world is based on Judeo-Christian principles. So in the same way, we can say these people have never read Foucault. They've never read Judith Butler. They haven't had all of these classes. Maybe they've had one or two here, but there's also a lot of Christians who are living a very Christian life who have maybe maybe read three pages of the Bible, but they're still acting out all of those Christian suppositions in their life. So I don't necessarily think we have to make to, to expect that all of these people have done that, but that also means that to, I think it was Kyle's point earlier, that we, it's tough to look for common values, but I think that's why it's important to look for common values, because a lot of these people don't realize that the values we share in common are very often antithetical to what they think is a, um, the ideological underpinnings of the things that they're acting out. That's an excellent point, because that's, part of what, if you're having a conversation with an, an SJW who is in it with good intent um, and just hasn't thought it through, if you're doing what, what Thomas is saying, like uh, trying to figure out, whittle things down to what do you agree on? A lot of times they think they believe in a certain thing, but their behavior or their ideology is completely at odds with that. And so if you can get them to say like, do you believe in free speech? Now, if you start talking to an SJW who'll just open, who, who just doesn't believe in free speech, well, that's one thing. But if you're talking with a liberal who's been 
seduced, let's say, or or to uh, Peter, the preacher who was talking before, if you're talking to a Christian who's been seduced by social justice and you, you asked, do you believe in free speech? If they're like me, I would have said, yes, of course. And then you can start from there and you can show them how they're, you can get to that place of maybe helping them see that the ideology does not hold up free speech principles. Or right. do you believe in um, violence or the non-aggression principle? If they say, I believe in the non-aggression principle, then you know, social justice doesn't. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah, yeah that's a great, I, great point. I think that, especially with free speech, if you both identify that that is a shared value, and then you can even speak to why it's important, then you can get to why some of the um, ideas within the ideology or the literature itself don't necessarily support that. And sometimes it's even um, blatantly speaking out against it. Uh, let's try Joel one more time. Joel, do you want to try your Thanks. mic again? How's that now? Perfect. Can you guys hear me? Okay, great. Uh, I wanted to touch on a point made earlier about um, borderline personality disorder and handling them. Just from personal experience, I work in a state mental hospital in California, and I deal with schizophrenics and borderline personality and patients with different mental disorders all the time. And I found that when sort of an analogy here when when someone's in a crisis they they usually have some delusional thought content you know there's vampires or you're you, you called me a child molester or something like that and then in a crisis usually the staff will do mo more listening than trying to talk because the the person who's having the crisis is operating exclusively on an emotional level and there's no logic at all and you can't talk them out of it. so you do a lot of listening you just kind of affirm what they say emotionally and then a lot of times later the patient like i've had incidents where a patient screamed at me and tried to attack me and ran after me kicked the door ran after me spit on me whatever and then since i have a relationship with that patient they later came up to me and themselves and said hey you know sorry about that and stuff and you have to give them time to come down and maybe takes a day or two and to Thomas, Thomas's point to sort of key these in, I spent some time working in a state prison as well as a nurse. And at that time, which was like 2011, 2012, I was like pretty socially justice and pretty liberal. I'm still liberal, but you know, on the left. And I had a, I had a, some success in being like the only like lefty there when I would have interactions with my coworkers who were all uh, correctional officers and stuff by agreeing with them and disarming them, you know, they were all Republicans and stuff. And I made a lot, I made some good friendships, even though I was like considered the freak, you know, guy from San Francisco, just by disarming them with an agreement. And then you see, you mix, you get some common ground. And then it's like, rather than fighting fire with fire, you're fighting fire with a fire extinguisher and you need to calm them down. And then you can, then you can meet, make, have some common ground. Thanks. That's exactly, I love that many people Sam and Joel and others have said that is yes, find those points of agreement that in my experience, if you ever make, if I've ever made any progress in a conversation with someone I disagreed with, it was because we figured out what we agreed on first, usually. Yeah, we have, we've been going for almost three hours. I'm not sure we should, <laughs> I think there's, I know there's a couple more people with their hands up, um, but I'm, I'm thinking we should Wrap up, Carrie, what do you think? Um, is there anyone who wanted to speak? So we had such a big group today. Is there anyone who wanted to speak and didn't get to speak? Uh, Jeff, uh, um, I'm trying to see, what are some of the other names here? If not, that's okay, you don't have to. I don't see any hands going up. So yeah, I think we, well, Jeff's hand is up. Let's put Jeff up. <laughs> uh. I don't see Jeff's hand being up. Jeff. No, I mean, his Jeff? actual physical hand is up. Can you? Oh. Unmute? Yeah, you can speak, He's, Jeff. Well, um, he can uh, speak if he wants to. Yeah. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, I don't think he has a microphone. Oh, well, that would be. That would explain why we can't hear him. All right. Well, um, oh, sign language. Oh, oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, no, that's Peter. No, that's Peter. Oh. It's funny yeah. he has a microphone, but he doesn't have a microphone. 
Jeff, your microphone icon is not showing up, so I don't know if we can hear you, unfortunately. Um, uh, any Anyone else before could we... I, could I just say like just a quick point? Sure. Okay. Um, so I, we've talked a lot about social justice and whatnot, and um, I think it'd be worth it for everybody to go listen to, and Carter, you, you mentioned him, to Yuri Bezmenov. Um, he was a KGB agent who defected back in like the 70s or the 80s and went on to like give these long lectures that <laughs> probably don't seem long to us anymore because we're all used to to watching Joe Rogan and three-hour podcasts like the one we're on right now. Um, but he, he does go into the fact that they actually, that the Soviets would utilize so, and, and strengthen and exacerbate social justice movements in various countries that they wanted to destabilize because they knew that it just tore at the fabric of, of the societies there. Um, so I think that's really important to mention. It's a great talk. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to say, because we're all talking about like what to do. And I'm, I'm very torn because as a, as a person who appreciates logic and nuance and test, uh, test, test. You know, intellectual discussion, I think obviously like I want to convince people that <laughs> this, this thought process that they're on is destructive and wrong. The flip side of it is like we're also human beings and animals and we respond to behavior and stimulus. And, um, and I think a lot of what we're seeing with social justice is the reinforcement of, of bullying such that, you know, so much of what they're trying to do is, is to ostracize and to make us feel like, um, you know, we're running the risk of being pressed outside of society if we say the wrong thing. We all, we all know that that's the fear. Um, so I wanted to say like, if everybody, first of all, like if everybody could drop their, their Twitter handles like in the chat, um, the more that we all connect and we stay connected, the less that we're gonna feel like the, the risk of ostracism is great enough to keep us from speaking our truth. Um, but I think the other thing to remind, to remind like ourselves is that sometimes you just have to like, come right back at them and say, something along the lines of, of, I see what you're doing. You're, you're attempting to use ostracism to make me like, to make me cave to your point of view. Um, and I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> like, I, I know that you're employing these, these tactics, which are just plain wrong. And I think we need to, it's difficult. Like, it's difficult to stand up and say what you believe. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm a musician. I get up and play in front of people and feel great. But me, like speaking right now, this is more difficult because we're talking about things that we haven't really grappled with. We're all afraid because we're not totally uh, certain of our own beliefs. And they're preying on us because of that, because they've realized, hey, ostracism works. The threat of ostracism works. Um, and we're going to keep doing that. So as soon as, like, I think more of us need to simply just say, you know, to, for lack of a better word, some sort of Thing that's authentic to you shut the fuck up like and I, I mean not in the best way but like you're not going to tell me how to believe there's there's nothing that says that your point of view is better than mine and i see what you're doing and i'm done with it so obviously credit to where you know it's due for the rest of the people talking about gentler ways agreeing and initially finding common ground and like i said there's a big part of me that wants that to be true also I think there's some sort of balance in there of like pursuing that because that's better, but also like not letting this behavior of ostracism, of bullying perpetuate itself. Because as soon as they, like one person sees somebody cave, then somebody else says, hey, it works. Like I'm going to keep doing this and I'm going to keep pushing because it's all about power. And all they want to do is, is, as Carter was saying, they want to control. It's not about making things better. It's about controlling. And so... Anyway, my, my two thoughts, like I said, if you guys like put your Twitter handles in the comments, I'm happy to follow you all and, and help, uh, help this community that we're creating. So thank you guys. Is this well said, Cecil. Oh, Jeff, Jeff's mic is working. Let's, let's hear from Jeff. I, I'll just uh, make this uh, kind of quick. And uh, I actually go for um, my YouTube handle is 2A Self-Defense Law. So it's nice to uh, be on here. And when I first saw you guys reading this book, I read it. I, it was a tough book for me to get through because um, 
this is something where I want uh, Carter and Carrie to, to, to be the, the expert at. I don't want to dive into um, to what, what I could really consider as a sick, narcissistic uh, uh, type of predator uh, bind. And if you want to really look at uh, my past, you know, if this was a, a moral world and I would be a libertarian um, or I will be more on the conservative side as far as, far as uh, fiscally, but socially I'd be probably be more in the middle. And what I really found hard about this book is that um, I think I, I came into this conversation late. So I think Harry was talking about it a little bit when I was, uh, I was in it. And it was really discussing liberalism on the European continent. I really wouldn't call it a classical Euro, uh, liberalism point of view, but I like classical liberals uh, like Harry and, and like um, um, other people like that, because at least you can talk with a reasonable person. And I actively do not engage uh, with narcissists. I go out of my way not to, to feed their fuel because they're, they're not disagreeing with you because of ideology. They are agreeing with you for their own sick, perverted sexual tendencies of that emotional fuel that they get. I just don't want to do it at all. Um, but, you know, you need to cultivate, you know, the, the right wing um, produces a certain amount of ick. The left wing produces a certain amount of ick. And you have to recognize that even though there may be a justification for like a second wave feminism um, or a first wave fe feminism, which I agree with, eventually it's going to get our way out, out of control. The it, it's, it's, it's interesting. More people die from eating plants than, than, than what they do from eating meat. And you have to fertilize something. And I think, what liberalism has gotten to is that it's fertilizing a narcissistic predatory point of view that it needs to be recognized. And, you know, I'm fairly familiar with, with Helen and I, I, you know, since I'm, I, you know, I'm not a little copy of her. So, um, you know, things are going to be a, a little bit different, but the right needs to recognize what it what it breeds the left needs to recognize that currently that they are putting fertilizer and creating wisteria creating that that disease that is feeding on people's soul i have kids going through school right now and i am kind of glad that they're not in school right now because I don't want them telling my 14 year old and my 12 year old that they are evil because they breathe in white skin. This is an evil, absolutely evil, predatory way of creating power between people. When I, when I enter a room, I enter where the room is saying, God, this is a good crowd. These people who enter the room, they're going to say, oh, yeah, got a couple Samoans over there, oh, a black woman over there, mm -hmm. some white men over there. This isn't diverse enough. This crowd should be disbanded and get more people in there. So I'm going to leave with that. I appreciate what this channel is. It's a way for me to get in there and get a little bit because I read enough um, and this book, hard for me to read. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, thank you, Jeff. Um, Jeff, Carrie? is, is uh, wisteria, that's a plant. Would it be accurate to say it's like kudzu? Kudzu is what we have in South Carolina. It just grows and grows. And it covers up other plants, and then it kills them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I just became aware of that. It it just grows in, on everything. Yeah, yeah. It, it's funny. I actually 
was watching Finding Big Bigfoot, right? one of those TV shows, and that came on. So yeah, that's how I learned about that. So maybe uh, you're right. It just totally consumes and grows on you. Yeah, that's probably yeah. right. Well, I certainly, uh, I certainly do like the the reference to um, the coddling of the American mind and bringing psychology in into this because I think there is definitely a um, a relationship between psychology and some of these ideological beliefs and how they are presented and they, they, they redound upon one another. So, um, but we are, we've been going for almost, almost three hours uh, at this point. So I think we should probably say thank you and goodbye to everyone. <laughs> uh, uh, can I say thank you? Also, thank you everyone. This was, yeah. I, I, I love it. I love this conversation. I love this community. And to all the new people, I hope you come back for future books. We alternate between fiction and nonfiction. So next month we're doing fiction. What are we doing, Carter? Uh, Thought Criminal by Michael Rechtenwald. Um, and we're going to have him on the show at some point soon. I don't know when, but uh, yeah. So that's the next one. Uh, I don't remember the date, but it's on unsafespace.com uh, slash book club. I don't know. Slash something. Book club, whatever. <laughs> unsafespace.com. There's a link. <laughs> I don't remember uh, exactly where it is. But again, thank you all for joining. I really appreciate the um, the thoughts. And the, you guys were all pretty decent to, to each other. It, it didn't get people weren't talking over on each other, uh, over each other at all or anything. So um, appreciate that. We will see you guys on Monday for Go Puffy Break. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, we have a deep content library that includes interviews with everyone from Mike Cernovich to Megan Murphy. So go check it out. If you'd like to see more, please consider supporting the show by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on all the major social media platforms, at least for now. And you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space chat on Telegram. See you there. Warning. This is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized by the cathedral. Pay no attention to it. For your protection, the following co-conspirators have been unpersoned and marked for cancellation. Failure to publicly denounce these individuals may result in re-education and or termination. Here's a fun fact. It was never really about the virus. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. This completely fair and democratically elected administration has been brought to you by Xi Jinping, the most Computer voice, Curtis. Never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.